recording just to let, just let everybody know. And um, we will go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm Kim Brewster. I'm Deputy Director with Chagrin River Watershed Partners. Uh, we're really excited to present this uh, training today, use of a stormwater basin retrofit screening tool in Ohio's Central Lake Erie watersheds. Um, the training will be led by Sustainable Streams, and um, this is for the Central Lake Erie Basin Collaborative and its partners. Um, so the Central Lake Erie Basin Collaborative or a network of watershed organizations and initiatives in Northern Ohio, um, we work together for the health of Lake Erie and its watersheds. Um, so through this unique model of regional collaboration, <clears throat> we share services and resources. Uh, we enhance efficiencies, we fill gaps in service, and we increase the power of our collective voice. Um, so we've got lots of folks from the collaborative here in our training today. Um, and we've also got representatives from some of our funder and partner uh, representatives, including Ohio EPA, um, also uh, representatives from some local Northeast Ohio stormwater utilities, um, and also communities that are served by the Central Lake Erie Basin Collaborative. Um, some of those communities which shared basin data uh, for the development of this tool. So thank you for joining us today, everybody. So the Collaborative received an Ohio EPA Section 319 grant uh, with matching funds from additional partners. And one of the collaborative's goals um, as a network is to attain and maintain the state's water quality standards for Northern Ohio streams. And this includes reducing the impacts of stormwater pollution on streams in developed watersheds. So stormwater basin retrofits um, can be a useful and cost effective way to reduce the impacts of stormwater on Ohio's streams. So one of the deliverables of this uh, 319 funded grant project was to develop a screening tool for stormwater basin retrofit opportunities that will help users identify potential retrofit opportunities and then take the next steps towards implementation of a retrofit appropriate for that particular site. So the collaborative is really pleased to be working with sustainable streams uh, for development of this tool, which can be used by the collaborative and our partners. So sustainable streams will be leading us through this training and it'll cover the use of the stormwater basin retrofit screening tool. So um, in addition to support from the Ohio EPA Section 319 grant program, uh, this project is also supported through matching funds from the George Gund Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, Lake County Stormwater Management Department, the William Bingham Foundation, uh, Sugar River Watershed Partners, and Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. So we're thankful to the Section 319 program and all of our matching partners as well. Um, so just a couple of reminders for today's training. Um, this training is being recorded and it will be shared on CRWP's YouTube page. And for those of you uh, with the collaborative today, we'll also be sharing that on Box as well. We will have some breaks and times for Q&A, uh, but if you do have a question during the presentation, feel free to um, use the chat function um, or to raise your hand to ask a question. Um, and we'd be glad to address those with you. Um, and again, just a reminder uh, to please mute unless you're speaking, that'll help us with um, noise control. Um, we do have some training modules that Sustainable Streams has developed for this training. They can be viewed um, you know, before you view the training or you know, after the training's wrapped up, uh, but it's just supplemental information to really enhance your knowledge of the topics that we're gonna cover today. And so there are four modules listed at the bottom of the screen, and those are available on CRWP's YouTube page um, for uh, collaborative representatives. They're also available on the Collaboratives Box account. Um, so if you have any trouble accessing those, please let us know. But I really encourage you to check out those modules if you haven't already. Um, there is also a guidance document that Sustainable Streams has developed to help uh, users in the use of the screening tool that really walks you through many of the um, concepts that we're going to cover today. So if you haven't already taken a look at that, really encourage you to do so after this training. Um, so it will be available at CRWP's website 
And uh, for collaborative uh, folks, it's also available on Box, our file sharing website. So here's our agenda for today. Um, it, this will be a three hour training or, or slightly under three hours, uh, somewhere around there, uh, but we will have plenty of breaks throughout the training um, and time for questions and answers. Um, so we're really excited for the training. Again, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, thanks to our funders and partners. And uh, we're really excited to have Sustainable Streams lead us through this training. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to the Sustainable Streams team. All right. Thanks, Kim. Let's see. And I think you all see in two screens. Just one. Are you seeing the presenter view or the? the... You'll have two screens right now. It's two? Two screens, yeah. yes. Yeah. All right, we'll swap it. All right, yeah, now we're ready. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for the introduction and to um, all the sponsors and, and uh, partners on this. Um, this is kind of the name of our game. We absolutely love to collaborate with our mission of, um, you know, providing that science service and solutions towards making our waterways uh, much healthier. Um, and so we're really excited to, to have partnered with you all. This has been a really, um, it's, it's, you know, it is a part of a collaborative and it's been an incredibly collaborative process. Um, and so um, we really appreciate all the input uh, from the partners and um, very happy with the, the final product. So we're going to uh, throw a lot of information at you today. Um, you know, we got a lot to pack into this, this training, but the good news is it's being recorded. You'll have access to the video. There's a guidebook or a guidance document that supports it. And then there's those three or four uh, training modules that can kind of help you with uh, more of the nuts and bolts of kind of you know, watershed delineation, finding basins, using GIS, those kinds of things. So, um, you know, if, if some of this feels like, you know, it's a, um, you need a little bit more support, there's, there's kind of more support out there as part of this tool. So, um, yeah, and then uh, as Kim said, uh, we have, uh, we've built in, uh, we kind of revised the agenda since, since some, um, that previous slide and, and we've got about five or so built-in breaks. So, and we will let you know when that happens so that you can um, feel free to like un unmute yourself and ask questions or we'll check the chat box, make sure we hit your, your questions at those breaks. So um, to begin, um, basin retrofits uh, can be a cost-effective tool in watershed restoration. Um, and, um, and, and that's what today's training is all about, is basically identifying, help, helping you figure out whether an individual basin is a good candidate for retrofit, and also helping you figure out kind of a sub watershed or watershed where basin retrofitting uh, can make a very positive impact on uh, kind of moving the needle in the streams uh, based on your goals, whether it be reducing flooding or erosion or improving water quality or all of that. Um, but there are other tools out there for watersheds. You know, not all watersheds are created equal. And uh, some watersheds, you might get more, you, you, you might get a lot more benefits with these highly cost effective detention basin retrofits um, because you might have a lot more basins out there to retrofit, for example. You might have a lot of stormwater already being routed to, to, to basins. But in, in some of the, our other um, watersheds, where we don't have a lot of existing basins, you know, you might need other tools like bankful wetlands, or we call them off-channel uh, floodplain wetlands, um, uh, hand-placed log structures and kind of existing forested reaches. We've done a lot of those with conservation district partners. And then um, even like new SCMs like uh, stream wetland complexes and, and so forth. So um, Anyway, it's, it's one, one tool in the toolbox, but it's a very cost-effective tool if you can find the right basin. So that's what this training is all about, is um, finding the right basin. But to begin, uh, we got to set the stage with why, why are we talking about retrofitting stormwater basins in the first place? Like, I thought they already managed stormwater. Why, they need to, why do they need to be retrofit? So um, it's important to remember kind of the historical context 
of, um, of stormwater management. And um, basically since, um, since the you know, very first um, development was ever put down uh, through very kind of modern practices, uh, we, we've yet to see many examples of streams in developed watersheds that um, you know, are supportive of kind of the biological richness that you see in reference streams. So this is a plot of uh, 73 sites from Northern Kentucky uh, with the impervious area on the, on the bottom here. And it shows that, you know, EPT richness, so that, so the sensitive tax of the mayflies, stoneflies, the caddisflies, uh, that richness uh, drops off very quickly at, at, once you get above about 3% impervious area in the watershed. And then once you get above 10% total impervious area, it kind of flatlines at a, at a pretty low number. So, uh, and these data include both watersheds that have no stormwater detention and uh, watersheds that have a lot of conventional stormwater detention and even some watersheds that have kind of flood control detention and um, uh, kind of water quality BMPs. So um, it, it just kind of underscores that. So until very recently and maybe even to, still to the today, uh, our conventional stormwater controls haven't really protected um, biological communities. And so um, we use this um, pre-developed hydrograph as kind of an example of, of why, of how we have managed stormwater in the past. And so here's our, uh, you know, pre-developed uh, two-year discharge. This is a case study from Colorado. Um, and then, you know, up until about the 50s or even as late as the 80s, uh, basically uh, development practices involved building the houses and roads and buildings routing the water as quickly as possible away from those structures uh, to a closed pipe stormwater system and then routing that water as quickly as possible to a surface drainage uh, like a stream or a creek. And so we get a lot more runoff because of the impervious surface and that the more efficient drainage network creates a lot higher peak flow. So uh, no surprise that resulted in a lot of flooding down in our valleys and our, in our you know, open channels, our streams and creeks. And that was not, you know, protective of public safety. So, um, you know, different communities vary, but, you know, between probably the, the 50s, at least uh, beginning, maybe as early as the 50s, but definitely by the 80s and 2000s, um, we had what you would call kind of classic flood control detention retention basins, where instead of routing that water straight to a creek, you would route it to a, a, a basin that basin would basically take that extra volume and store it and kind of cap its release in a way that matched the pre-developed peak flow um, and, and then just kind of prolong that, that uh, peak discharge there. All the extra volume from the, the red hydrograph is expressed in this green hydrograph, but you see the peaks match the pre-developed condition. Um, so what that resulted in is a lot of kind of classic detention basins, retention basins, uh, but a lot of those detention basins that are kind of everywhere throughout the landscape, you almost never see water in them. Even when it's raining, you hardly see water in them because they're really not designed to kick in and really start to attenuate um, stormwater until you get a pretty large event. Like uh, typically the minimum is the two year event. That's when they really start to kick in, uh, the two year discharge and above. And so, um, you know, for 99% of the storms of typical year, you have very little attenuating effect because you're not really close to that two-year uh, rainfall volume. And so these smaller events, so say 0.3 inches in an hour, basically blow right through our detention basins, or at least our conventional flood control basins, and you, you can kind of get these raging river conditions on a very, very low rainfall event. Uh, whereas a you know undeveloped reference channel, uh, similar rainfall. This is what you see. Uh, similar similar um, time of year, uh, and this picture was taken about three hours after the rainfall event, right at the time of peak discharge, um, because it's doing what it has it has evolved to do. The leaves are intercepting the rain. Um, the, the ground cover is slowing down the rain, you get that shallow infiltration into the soils, and then that shallow infiltration hits the clay subsurface, makes its way down valley, and then very gradually causes this blip that, you know, you know, increases the stage by, you know, less than a half a foot 
in our in our pool, right? So so kind of cool, clean water that's you know delayed after the the precipitation. Um, so we totally miss those those kind of uh, small events, right, with our conventional detention basins. And uh, because we totally miss it, we're sending lots of non-point source pollution downstream. Um, so, uh, so what what we realized sometime between 2000 and 2015, it depends on the different communities when they were an MS4, when it was required by the state. But in general, at some point, if your if your um, municipality was large enough, you had to start doing water quality volume controls, where you take a modest amount of rain, say the 80th or 90th percentile event, and you get that routed into a feature that um, holds that water. So like an extended detention basin with a sediment floor bay or a, or a you know, bioinfiltration basin or some of those newer age green infrastructure, um, you know, BMPs. But you know, the idea is you, 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 you don't really have to adjust the size of your kind of classic flood control basin much because, you know, you already have the space. You're just kind of trying to knock the first flush down and um, prevent those pollutants from reaching our, our waterways. And so, you know, you ended up with, with things like this, uh, really beautiful, um, you know, stormwater practices that can, you know, add to the aesthetics of a, of a you know, neighborhood, for example. Um, but in, in summary, you still, you know, between the regional flood control and the water quality volume, we still have this zone that, you know, where we're not really holding back the, the peaks too much, but we're above the water quality. And that's right at the zone where channel erosion typically begins in a lot of our Ohio and Kentucky streams. And so um, uh, at this point, I just want to in introduce the concept of the critical discharge for stream bed erosion. So this idea, if you've heard me talk before, I you know, talk about this a lot, but this idea that you know, you've got, every stream has kind of a threshold where if the stream uh, is, is flowing less than that discharge, you're not really mobilizing the particles on the bed, but once you get above that discharge, you start to really entrain the particles on the bed and you know, that leads to a geomorphic response and a biological response if you had a bug that was living on these rocks and those rocks become mobilized, that can be kind of a, a catastrophic event for, for those uh, macroinvertebrates, for example. And so going back to our kind of example here, this dashed line represents the critical discharge for this system. And this is from Colorado. It's a little bit sandier, a little bit finer. And so its critical discharge is about 20 or 25% of the two-year peak discharge. Uh, our, our streams are a little bit more resistant. It tends to be about 40% or 50% of the two-year peak discharge in Ohio and Kentucky. But in general, you see here's our, here's our critical discharge, and you compare that time of the hydrograph above the critical discharge, and you kind of break that out. Under pre-developed conditions, we would have had erosion uh, with the two-year event, right? But it would have been relatively um, you know, short and not so extreme, right? Under the no detention uh, uh, condition, we get a lot more runoff and results in a lot higher peak discharge. And so we get a lot more work done on the channel. Under the conventional peak matching detention uh, retention design, uh, you see we have a lot more time of erosive discharges for that two year event. And so that results in, uh, you know, you do that over and over. So more time at the two year discharge and then maybe even the the one year, six month, three month, more frequent events, you start mobilizing those particles too frequently and they don't get replaced by particles from upstream. And all of a sudden you've, you've mobilized those bed particles and you resulted in kind of a, a scouring and down cutting and then you know, sort of cascading head cuts that migrate upstream and you know, make our channels deeper. Uh, that leads to you know, unstable banks and widening uh, water quality impacts, you know, sediments kind of a leading um, cause of pollution in Ohio and, and, and Kentucky streams. And, um, you know, stream bank erosion is one of the dominant sources of, of, uh, of sediment. And then, of course, the biological disturbance, not only the habitat degradation, but also the physical disturbance of the rocks that, that the bugs live on being mobilized, right? So this, um, this figure, this is, this is the profile view kind of looking at it, the stream from the side. But remember this figure because 
we have a picture of um, one of our pilot watersheds um, in Ward Creek, where the closer you are to the, the base level, so like, you know, it's tie in with the, with this backwater of Lake Erie, for example, you're going to have less ability to down cut and therefore your channel is going to be a lot better off if you're protected by grade control than, it, than the farther upstream you are from that grade control or hard point. Um, and the hard point could be a, you know, uh, like I said, base level from uh, Lake Erie. It could be a bedrock. Uh, it could be a culvert. But the farther you are upstream from a, from a channel hard point, the more dramatic your incision and therefore kind of geomorphic instability can be. Um, now looking at it from a channel cross-section view, again, imagine you've got these particles on the bed and because of that conventional detention design, you've mobilized those particles. They haven't been replaced by particles from upstream. So you've incrementally made your stream deeper. You do that over and over and over. You start to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Your banks start to get unstable, unstable to the point of what we call geotechnically unstable and mass wasting. So the banks are failing by the, their own weight. And, and that leads to kind of a vicious cycle of the bank fails and it leaves a more vertical bank that is, again, continues to be unstable. And so that widening perpetuates until the stream becomes so wide that you start to see aggradation at the uh, toes of the banks because the stream has become so wide and the slope has flattened out. If you remember that profile figure where the slope was flattening out. Um, so it's, it's, it's figuring out a way to reduce its, its energy. And now you've got aggradation occurring. And eventually after many decades uh, or longer, you can get this, uh, you can reattain a new state of equilibrium, a new state of, of stability. Um, a balance uh, between your kind of erosive forces and your, and your resistance in your channel. But without any intervention, this process takes uh, decades plus. Uh, we've got many sites that have been developed for 50 plus years and they're nowhere near this uh, recovery state um, across a lot of settings, including settings out in Washington state and, and um, kind of Maryland and, and Ohio and Kentucky streams. So, so this process, even though we see it happen, it takes a long time if nothing is done with the excess energy and the excess stormwater coming through these systems. So we understand how stormwater, uh, kind of conventional stormwater practice contribute to that cycle of geomorphic instability that affects water quality and, and, and biotic integrity. So um, we had this idea that, you know, if, if the tension basins cause this problem, can they be retrofit to uh, contribute to a solution to this problem? So um, way back in, I think 2012, uh, we got um, uh, support from US EPA um, to uh, collaborate with them on a detention basin retrofit technology uh, where you simply, uh, this is a 24 inch outlet that we restricted to about an eight inch outlet with a passive gravity bypass for the larger events. And so the idea here is let's restrict those more frequent events, the, the three month, six month, one year events, make them not cause erosion anymore in the receiving stream, allow this passive bypass for um, you know, the, the larger events like the hundred year events so that the basin still has the same level of performance in terms of not overtopping the spillway, things like that. So we had this idea, US EPA got behind it, and we piloted it. And um, so here's, here it is in action. You see, this is, this is a ponding um, where, you know, it's right at the top of that 24 inch diameter pipe. So without the retrofit, this thing, the event would have kind of went right through the basin without any real attenuation. Uh, with the restricted outlet, we get a lot of um, attenuation, a lot, a lot of reduced discharges. Um, here's how we designed it. And this is, this is, um, Kind of detailed in the um, in the guidance, um, the idea with uh, retrofits is you're you know you're looking at these standard design storms like the three month, six month, one year, two year. Under you know here's our pre-developed uh, conditions, right? Here's our uh, pre-retrofit out, outflows. So um, basically, under under the uh, conventional uh, design. Uh, the three month, six month, and one year, they all exceeded 
the critical discharge, which was about 0.38 cubic meters per second. Um, so about 13 CFS. So those, the three month storm, six month, one year storm, they all exceeded that critical discharge. Under the post retrofit condition, though, all those storms are restricted below that critical discharge. And so, um, you know, that, that's gonna have a lot of benefits to the, to the receiving stream network. You see the two year discharge still exceeds the critical discharge, but some basins you'll be able to actually get the two year to be less than the critical discharge as well. Just depends on the capacity of the basin. And then you see that we've reduced the flows, that we've reduced the peak flows for every event up to the, even the 100 year event, right? And um, all we did with that extra um, ponding there was we basically took up about 21 centimeters of that um, freeboard in the 100 year event. So that it had something like 25 centimeters before the event or before the retrofit. And, you know, uh, it had, it, it was still contained in the basin post retrofit. So we don't have any overtopping of the spillway um, with the 100 year discharge. So that's, that's the idea of using that uh, excess freeboard in, that, in the basin that's already there and letting the pond, pond get a little bit deep, deeper, just kind of incrementally deeper so that you can throttle back those more common uh, flows and also uh, contribute to you know, reduce flood discharges downstream as well. So here it is in action, again, partnering with US EPA, you get lots of good data. So you have a peak inflow greater than 20 CFS, peak outflow way down less than four CFS. Again, our critical discharge is about 13 CFS in this system. So well below that critical discharge, um, you can aggregate all those data and um, here are kind of the, the cumulative hydrographs expressed in a, in a, me a flashiness measure. And we have our, um, this, this is kind of looking at what's happening downstream in the receiving stream network. So we have a spur site that is a direct tributary to our detention basin that we retrofit. We have an upstream control site that, you know, has receives flow from the upstream areas and has no, um, no detention basin retrofit uh, affecting it. And then we have a downstream site. And what we show is um, that uh, between the pre-retrofit period and the post-retrofit period, it got a lot rainier. The rain events got more intense, but they also had longer periods of dry, dry weather. And so basically our, our, our peak flows got worse at our upstream site and our, dry, our kind of low flows got worse as well at our, our uh, upstream site, our control site. So that says the rain kind of changed. But what happened at our spur, uh, under the post-retrofit conditions, the peak flows got better, they got lower. And our base flows went from, this channel went from being dry about 10% of the time to you know, being kind of having perennially wet pools, which is clearly a benefit for um, uh, the fish and macroinvertebrates that live in those pools. And then the downstream site you see under this um, about nine month, one year period of uh, equal time periods of post retrofit, pre retrofit periods, uh, the benefits of, this, of the retrofit kind of washed out the more erosive rain um, uh, during the same period. So we have basically hydrographs that are right on top of each other. So in terms of uh, that, that extended base flows, for example, that supports ecological lift. So again, you know, if you have a pool that doesn't stay wet all the time, you can't support fish. We've been out to the site a lot, including in August and September, and we've seen fish in this pool every time. So we're, we're seeing that, you know, uh, biological lift, uh, which is, you know, really, really important if you're, if you're uh, yeah, a fish or a macroinvertebrate that depends on those uh, pools staying wet. We also see the effect on the stream bed erosion. So at our upstream control site, we see continued coarsening at our, at our site where the bed is getting coarser, but at our, at our retrofit spur site, we're getting, we're seeing aggradation. So, um, you know, that, that bed is not, is no longer getting coarser. It's actually, uh, you know, getting finer again. And then the downstream control site uh, over the first four year period, it was basically very, very similar to what it was under the pre-retrofit conditions. Um, and then um, kind of uh, looking even farther out, so six years out after the retrofit, um, here's a kind of before retrofit picture. We got vertical banks at our, at our spur site. Um, and and uh, six years later, we have 
those we got deposition at the toe of the bank. That deposition has been colonized by vegetation. So now we have benches being developed. We also have more wood retention in the channel because you're just not getting those frequent um, you know, pulses of high flows that just float the logs away. Instead, we're getting those very restricted releases for kind of the everyday rain events that just saturate the wood and help it um, kind of get waterlogged so that it can stay, so that it doesn't float when you get the big events. Um, at, at the downstream site, uh, a before picture, vertical banks, um, a tree with exposed roots, and then you know six years later we have uh, the same tree that used to have the roots exposed. Uh, you no longer see the, the exposed roots. Uh, we got it because we have a bench that was developed that was then colonized by vegetation. And so we got that, we've kind of flipped the switch in terms of geomorphic trajectory. We went from a degradational um, trajectory with continued kind of widening and flushing of the sediment to a aggradational trajectory where the, the banks fail, the sediment stays at the base of the banks, and then it stays stable long enough for the vegetation to colonize it. So here's the, um, you know, don't just believe a picture. Here's the actual data where we show the bench being developed, right, um, at, that, at that downstream site. And then here's some, some uh, here's what happened at our control site, our upstream site over the same time period. So before the retrofit, um, we had vegetated benches, vegetated banks. Here's a log, an aerial log for reference, that same log right here. And after uh, the retrofit, um, you know, the upstream site got worse. So the banks got worse, uh, not vegetated. We, we see widening in the, in the geometry and no more vegetated benches. And so basically this upstream site is kind of going through the classic channel evolution process where, um, you know, uh, kind of inadequately managed stormwater runoff is making the flows more erosive. And so it's been down cutting. Now the banks are unstable. Now it's widening and it's going to continue down that path. Whereas our spur and our downstream site, we kind of flip that switch. So in terms of, and that, that has, ge that geomorphic trajectory change has also benefited habitat. So here's, here's our uh, spur site before, uh, kind of the same view after. Uh, we have an RBP in the poor range before, and it's bumped up to average, uh, uh, you know, five years later, six years later. Same with our downstream site. This is the before shot, same view looking downstream. Uh, we've, we've increased it to about to an average RBP class. So uh, again, the, uh, the idea here is you take these kind of urban suburban sites that are in this down cutting and, and uh, unstable trajectory, and you very quickly try to induce them to go to aggradation and then, uh, you know, a, a new equilibrium with vegetated benches. So um, I'm getting ready to hand it off to Nora. Uh, we're going to pause for questions, but the the point of that beginning is, you know, we see the see the kind of problems caused by conventional attention, but now we know that retrofitting those conventional basins can can trigger these geomorphic responses that have these cascading benefits in terms of habitat, water quality, uh, and and ecological lift. And so um, the tool here is to help help you understand which basins make a good candidate for retrofitting and also uh, on an individual level, and then also how to kind of um, uh, find sub watersheds that where, where you can get enough basins retrofit to actually induce those trajectories of recovery in the receiving stream. So those are kind of the two primary goals of the, the rest of the presentation as we walk you through our tool. So with that, let's, um, let's take a quick pause. And if anyone has questions, uh, or if there's anything in the chat, let us know. And then I'm going to give control over to Nora here. This is Roy Merrick Roostone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, so this first site, very interesting. Um, it's first site, downstream and upstream. And on the upstream side, over the years after the retrofit, you get the uh, degradation and uh, it, it acts, of course, there is no control. I wonder, is your retrofit on the spur at all increasing gradient for that upstream segment 
and contributing to the degradation there? Oh, that's a good question, uh, Roy. Thank you for that. So, um, so actually, if you kind of think about a profile, right, and the, the stream is sort of, the head cuts are migrating upstream and that, that upstream site is getting deeper, right, and the banks are getting worse. Well, if you've got aggradation down here, that's building up the bed down here. It's making it less likely for that upstream site to, to, to um, get deeper, right? Because you've, you've actually increased the base level of the downstream site, or you've at least stopped it from getting deeper, right? So instead of this, and then this, and then this, right? It's more like you started going down and then this came back up. So now this might start building back up again, right? Or maybe it just wants down cut as much. So, so this would only be a positive influence on the upstream site, um, you know, in terms of the geomorphic response. Okay. One more question. Can you back up a few slides to the last chart you had? And I'm still back one again, 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 there. All right. Yeah. And this, uh, I don't know that I appreciated this entirely. Is a Q critical, should there be, I don't know how to say it, a column in there with Q critical for every uh, return period? I'm not, I'm not understanding how you can compare your pre and post retrofit outflow results with Q critical. Yeah, so, so good, another good question. So uh, the, the critical discharge for this stream is uh, 0.38 cubic meters per second. And that, that stays constant unless the stream itself changes. So if the okay. stream got steeper or if the stream got wider, the bed material got finer, whatever, that stays relatively constant. So then you can basically use that as your design target to say, look, before a retrofit, this was greater than 0.38. The six month was greater than 0.38. The one year is greater than 0.38. Now let's see how much we can restrict that outlet, that low flow outlet to see if we can get these flows to be less than 0.38 in the right. system. And that's, that was the, the, the idea there. So that is the, that's a great question because it really highlights the design process. It's really not a hard process in terms of, you know, you don't need a lot of training and sediment transport, uh, you know, complex equations. It's really just helping engineers understand this is your design target. And that Q critical, we say in general, unless you've got better data for your site, uh, we typically recommend a, a kind of rough preliminary target of about 40%, maybe 50% of the two-year undeveloped peak discharge. So take your pre-developed two-year, that was 0.95, multiply that by 0.4 or maybe 0.45, and that's your, that's your kind of Q-critical target unless you got better data for your site. Thank you. Great questions. Any anybody else before we move on? Uh, I'll ask real quick, Robert. That was a really cool and interesting. Thinking about climate change, you identified how with the one stream, the change in rainfall, and I just think, and you spoke to pools having water longer, and I think that is a really great um, indication that this is a, has is adaptive to climate change. I guess I just ask, are there any other facets of that adaptability to climate change that you consider with this? That's a great question. Um, so, so definitely uh, climate resiliency is a, is a really clear uh, benefit here, uh, both the prolonged base flows and the reduced peak flows. And, and that kind of leads into um, our tool actually, because one of the factors in, um, whether or not a basin makes an economical retrofit is whether it has a, um, a, an engineer spillway uh, that can handle those overtopping events. Because what we know with climate change is we're gonna get more and more of those extreme events, higher risk of overtopping. And so some basins have an engineered spillway and that they're, they're equipped to handle those overtopping flows. Other basins that might not have an engineered spillway, this kind of fits into that kind of global resiliency um, kind of preparedness um, for, you know, protecting communities from the, you know, more extreme weather events of climate change. The last thing we want to see a basin overtop 
without a spillway, the berm gets ripped through and it sends a big pulse of water downstream. So, you know, some, some basins, uh, some communities have a lot of basins that have no spillway and kind of systematically uh, evaluating them from a overtopping risk. And then if they need a spillway, well, shoot, if you're installing a spillway for safety, go ahead and restrict its discharges for erosion control for long base flows as well. So you're kind of getting that double, double benefit of, um, you know, climate resiliency and protecting your communities. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm going to, okay, here's Nora's slide. Uh, Nora, have you requested control yet? Okay, here we go. I, I hope I didn't miss any questions. Um, and if not, uh, we've got another break coming up shortly, but uh, thanks for those. And I, I'm going to hand it over to Nora. Thanks, Bob. Uh, all right. Um, so I will be introducing the tool itself here. Um, and, and I wanted to first kind of outline the goals that we had when we were developing uh, the, the tool. It was to find a retrofit opportunities to improve downstream flooding, erosion, and associated water quality impacts on streams and Lake Erie, to determine the feasibility and effectiveness of potential retrofit approaches, and to provide this um, with a decision process. The photo here is a retrofit that we did in Lindhurst, Ohio. Uh, what you can't see here is that um, this project was done in conjunction with stream daylighting downstream uh, and also that there are some residential houses just off the image on the left. Um, due to these, um, the houses, we weren't able to actually um, install just a simple retrofit. We were needing to do some excavation here. Uh, the total cost of the project was about $2,000. It did provide uh, many benefits beyond just reducing downstream erosion, uh, but we wanted to show this to you as it provides some, uh, you know, it, it puts uh, the simple retrofits that we'll be talking about uh, that are more in the $10,000 range really into perspective uh, compared to some watershed wide efforts. And I should just interject, I think Norma to say $200,000. This was a $200,000 project. Yes. All right. Uh, as we were, uh, can you go back, Bob? Not sure why it double clicked, thank you. Uh, so as we were conceptualizing um, the screening tool, we wanted to make this something that uh, could be done as a pre-engineering step. And we wanted to make it uh, sort of a more rapid exercise and provide this uh, it's simple enough that we uh, could apply it to you know, many communities, uh, many uh, different users could, could apply the tool uh, by providing it in this decision tree framework. We provide some early off-ramps uh, that, that are really the most simple types of retrofits uh, and also the most cost-effective. Uh, the, the tool provides step-by-step um, -step instructions with some transparent logic uh, to ultimately you know, prioritize these cost-effective opportunities. Uh, so before uh, I show you this decision tree, I uh, will kind of walk through what, what data is needed for, um, for application of the tool. The first is inventory of all the basins that you'll evaluate, uh, whether that's across a community, whether it's across a watershed, it may just be um, just a few retro or a few basins. Uh, of those that make the inventory list, you'll want to know the basin type. You'll, and, and having the configuration of the outlet structure um, is an important tool. Uh, we'll want to know what year or approximate year that the basin was constructed in, and also uh, if there's available freeboard. Uh, Bob kind of touched on the engineered spillway, so we'll be looking uh, for those basins that have an engineered spillway and or uh, if there are any apparent downstream safety risks. And then uh, lastly, for each basin, we'll want the drainage area and the storage volume. Uh, I'm going to make a plug for those uh, modules right now that are on the uh, CRWP website, or I'm sorry, the YouTube page. Uh, Shelby did, um, you know, sh the modules will help uh, with identifying that inventory of basins uh, if, if that is not something that's readily available for you. Uh, she'll walk through delineating a drainage area, calculating storage volume, and also getting some of the data 
sets uh, such as elevation data that you may need um, to generate a drainage area or storage volume. Uh, and so those are just some, some nice a la carte kind of background data um, if, if those are items that you'll, you yourself are not familiar with. So here we are. Um, this is the decision tree. Um, and as I walk through, um, I'll be talking about each node individually, providing um, some definitions and some understanding and, and background knowledge of why these items are important and, and sort of what we're looking for at each step. Uh, the, um, as I said, we wanted to provide some early off ramps. And so uh, there are really three types of retrofits that we'll focus on. The first being um, V-notch weir retrofits or some other um, equivalent type of um, retrofit that, that looks to lower a water surface. These are really simple to install uh, with really the lowest cost of the options that we present in the tool here. Uh, and they have um, a high benefit. When we say um, kind of lowest cost, we're talking in a ballpark of maybe a thousand to $3,000 for construction. Um, our second off ramp are some simple uh, restriction style retrofits. These um, are also a low cost option uh, and are, are less invasive really than our third type. Uh, and, and we're talking about maybe the 1,000 to about $10,000 range for these uh, retrofits. Uh, they can also have a really high benefit for the watershed. The third type of retrofit uh, that we will um, kind of get into uh, today is um, expensive retrofits, our, our third off ramp here. Uh, as the name says, with expensive retrofits, these do have a higher uh, cost. Uh, and we would look to implement these really on, on some of the largest um, and most impactful locations in the watershed, uh, such that that high cost is, is um, offset by having an, a, a really high benefit. And then lastly, um, you know, we don't want to um, kind of forget about any of our basins that we may want to revisit later. And so, uh, you know, we look to catalog any basin that doesn't um, rank out as a priority retrofit candidate. And we would, um, you know, they, they may be retrofits that can be implemented uh, for uh, maybe a higher cost or a lower benefit. Uh, but these also may be basins that we just don't have all the information right now. Uh, and, and say, getting it in your car and, and visiting the basins or, or doing um, a little more due diligence and, and gathering, say, design drawings uh, can help you populate all the information you need. And then uh, you can revisit the tool with, for those basins specifically. Um, and so uh, sort of with that, we will um, just kind of dive into each node. Um, the first node here being, is the SCM a wet or a retention basin? And so uh, you've got your list, you've got your inventory of basins, and you'll start kind of going through those and, and answering these questions. Uh, I'd, I'd first just like to define the terms of what is a wet basin or what is a retention basin. Uh, those two terms can kind of be used interchangeably. And these are basins that have, a, a, their, their lakes, pools, ponds, uh, they have you know, water permanently sitting in them. Uh, these top two photos were taken um, in the collaborative region uh, and the, the two lower photos um, you know, were taken elsewhere in Ohio and, and Kentucky. Uh, in the bottom, you can see this is a, um, a, a highly manicured, you know, there's rock around the, the perimeter, it's well mowed uh, and, and you know, that, that may be typical for something you see in an HOA um, and, and some of the ones uh, more on the top are a little more natural around, around the perimeter. Uh, the, the other type of basin uh, would be a dry basin or a detention basin. These uh, do not kind of control water or hold water in between storm events. Uh, on the lower left, we see um, a turf grass bottom. You can also have uh, more native or um, kind of just natural and wild vegetation, sort of like the upper left and the lower right uh, images. And then lastly, the, the image on the upper left, uh, you can kind of see the sun glinting off some water in the bottom. Uh, that was taken, um, that photo includes a, um, a ditch or a, a swale in the bottom that's, that's lined with concrete. Uh, that can be a common um, identifier of dry basins, uh, as many of them have included kind of that concrete swale to help um, flow travel through the basin more quickly. Uh, the, the third type of basin that you may find as you're inventorying and, and evaluating these basins is uh, 
a basin that's not actually for stormwater management. Uh, these might be just, you know, small ponds in people's backyards, or uh, they might be, um, they're commonly in farm fields uh, and not on, you know, agricultural property. Uh, and so you may run into some of those as you're uh, looking through the basins in your watershed or community. So once we have identified uh, or classified the basins and we know which ones are, are wet basins, we try to understand the ability to lower the permanent pool on those wet basins. And so what is a permanent pool? Uh, it is also called um, the normal pool and it is the water surface uh, where stormwater, when stormwater runoff is not in the basin. It's that uh, kind of lowest elevation that the the water will will sit in the in the pond. It is um, often at the uh, bottom of the lowest orifice on an outlet structure. And so here uh, we have the permanent pool shown in, in yellow. Uh, and on that concrete box, there's a small, probably six inch orifice. And you can see that the water is sitting right at the, the invert of that, um, at the bottom of that orifice. And so uh, this is that permanent pool elevation. And we'd be looking to understand if we can uh, you know, simply retrofit the, the basin to lower that. Uh, and so uh, next we, we ask what is that ability or how do we know about that ability? Um, it, you know, if a basin can be, can have its permanent pool lowered. And so uh, before I, I get too far, I want to explain just what that really means or what that, that might look like. Um, this is an example that was um, taken in a, in a park in Ohio. Uh, Bob actually um, was visiting this basin and noticed that the outlet structure um, in that upper photo, you can't even see it, it's, it's covered with debris and logs and it's completely clogged. Uh, and so he actually waited out in the stream and, and moved those logs. So between that upper photo and lower photo, the water surface dropped about three to four inches. And, and it's basically imperceptible um, in these photos that there's any change in the water surface. Uh, and we want to highlight that because many times you may be talking to um, members of the community, people who own the ponds, and they they um, are less than thrilled at the idea of lowering the permanent pool. Uh, it does not have to be um, anything too drastic. And, and here we see that, um, again, it's basically imperceptible, um, these, these smaller changes, uh, especially on basins that have native vegetation um, around them. And so, uh, you know, wet basins have, have many different outlet structures. And so when we're trying to understand a basin's ability to have the permanent pool lowered, uh, the key is to look at what the outlet structure looks like. Here um, are three different outlet structures on three different wet basins. On the uh, left here, we have a, a concrete uh, box outlet structure. Um, those are some really large windows on it, but it is just a, a concrete box that's sitting in the basin. Um, the middle photo is a culvert with a head wall, and on the right is a, um, a channel outlet on, on a wet basin. And so as we are um, you know, trying to determine if we are able or not to lower that permanent pool, uh, we're trying to come up with a way to lower it that doesn't involve pumping or major excavation. And so uh, across these three different outlet structures, uh, really the only, um, the only structure that we are able to provide a, a simple retrofit to lower the pool uh, is, is the basin on the left with that box outlet structure. Uh, because that structure extends down into the pond itself, uh, we would be able to cut um, an orifice in that box and actually permanently lower the pool. Uh, so we're creating a, a new lowest um, elevation orifice. And uh, on these other two, options, uh, both the culvert and the, the channel, we would actually have to get out there with an excavator, either lower the pipe, lower the channel, um, you know, significantly uh, interrupt the, the use of the pond sort of a thing um, and, and get really invasive. And that um, in this initial, uh, eval, you know, initial line of the, the tool, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for very, very simple. And so that is why this box structure uh, is a key candidate. Um, this this pond would be a key candidate for a simple um, V-notch weir, uh, which which takes us there. Once we have sort of evaluated the outlet control structures, 
and have identified those uh, that we can lower the pool, then we evaluate those for um, a V-notch weir or um, some other you know, retrofit type that, that would be equivalent. Um, again, these, these range in like say the one to $3,000 range uh, and, and um, can provide that, um, that high benefit. So what is a V-notch weir? Well, uh, here is an image um, instead of a box, this is a circular outlet structure on a basin, on a wet basin. And uh, the detail on the right really shows what this V-notch uh, weir is all about. Uh, we would cut kind of a trapezoidal or a, a V into, um, into the, the structure itself. And that uh, then drops that pool elevation to be as, you know, as, as low as your V-notch weir is tall. And so uh, it's a simple way to gain excess storage in the basin uh, because that, that, ele that depth is not taken up with water on a permanent basis anymore. It is storage that's then available during the rain events. Uh, we say or equivalent because uh, when it comes to engineering um, and modeling, really the sky's the limit on different alternatives um, that could be used. For certain applications, uh, small orifices or weep holes uh, may be ideal. By, um, and by having so many uh, small orifices here, it really limits um, the risk of, of any of them clogging and then not functioning uh, properly. You could also cut in instead of a V notch, you could cut in a rectangular or a, a square um, orifice. So really, uh, we do not mean to limit uh, any, you know, engineers insights and, and visions for a retrofit. Um, but this is just to say that, you know, the intent is to lower the water surface uh, by, by adding uh, new smaller orifices. Uh, so once we have identified, um, you know, those basins, we move on to uh, really all of the basins in the watershed um, or, or on your inventory list and evaluate them for adequate freeboard at Q100 to restrict the low flow outlet without grading. So what is freeboard at Q100? That is uh, the available distance between the water surface in the basin uh, during that 100 year uh, design storm, which you can see here that water surface is in blue. And it is the difference between that and then your top of the berm of your basin. And so this red arrow then denotes um, your freeboard at, at Q100. It's basically the excess uh, storage that would be there you know, uh, over and above the, the 100 year storm. Uh, but, but what does it mean to have adequate freeboard? Uh, as we were developing the tool, you know, as I mentioned, we want it to be available um, and useful to not only engineers, uh, but to anyone that, that wants to use it. And so, uh, we've sort of developed some screening metrics that are not, um, that really anyone can, can use and apply uh, for the basins that they are evaluating. Um, our first kind of step would be um, to uh, refer to you know, the, the regional or the local stormwater regulations to understand what the freeboard requirement is in that community or, or watershed. Uh, and then um, using that sort of as your, your yardstick to know if it's adequate. And so the screening level metrics um, for the, this preliminary screening tool is um, first to check the drawings and, and stormwater calculations. Uh, if, if those are readily available, that will be the easiest place and, and um, definitely the most accurate place for a screening level exercise to get, to get your freeboard information. Uh, and so you may be looking for information where freeboard is greater than one foot or uh, one foot is really what we see across most communities, but um, each community does, you know, they, they may have their own um, or a different, different regulation. We would also look um, sort of at the age of the basin. There's a few different ways that we could do this. Uh, you know, to, we want to be able to understand if the age of the basin corresponds to a period when freeboard uh, was a requirement in the stormwater regulations. And so we might do that through looking at aerials or even um, reviewing imperviousness uh, and the change in imperviousness to see when those basins were installed. And then lastly, uh, and I think it's probably my favorite way to understand if there's adequate freeboard is 
um, this, this idea of potential rainfall capture. Uh, we'll get into the equation for this um, in a few slides, but basically we're targeting um, you know, one inch of depth that could be hold in, held in the basin uh, without any discharge. Uh, we have found um, even in communities up in the, the Lake Erie region that um, you know, two inches is, is ideal, holding two inches in that basin, uh, but um, just at the screening level, uh, often there are basins that can hold one inch that, that will be able to be retrofit. So uh, two inches is better, but one inch uh, will do the trick. And so I'm just going to walk through kind of some of those, those items. Um, again, we first, if they're available, we would recommend checking the drawings. Uh, here is, is two screenshots. Um, the upper image is a grading plan from a screen or from a, a detention basin. And we can see that the top of the berm is, is highlighted. Um, and that has an, an elevation of, of 894. And then in the detail for the outlet structure, the 100 year elevation is listed. And when we do that math, we see that there is a one foot of freeboard um, available in the basin. And that um, would indicate that there, you know, yes, there is adequate freeboard to retrofit this basin. Uh, we could also check the stormwater calculations. Uh, oops. Here um, are two different examples. On the left is um, actually a basin that I had looked at retrofitting. Um, we had the top of the berm um, at an elevation of 818. And when we, we modeled the 100 year through it, um, it was very clear that the basin was not able to maintain or con contain the 100 year storm event. Uh, and so on this basin, we said, no, it was not a good candidate for retrofitting. Um, on the, on the right is um, a design uh, you know, output from a, a different modeling software. And this, um, we were able to collect the top of the berm elevation from the drawings. And we see the max elevation uh, that's provided in that hydrograph report. And we saw that, yes, this basin does have that adequate freeboard um, of, of greater than one foot. We can also look, um, as I said, at the age of the basin. And so, uh, one way to do that being evaluating recent um, imperviousness, uh, comparing the 2001 to the 2016 impervious data, uh, we can see the, a big increase in the amount of impervious. Uh, and this corresponds uh, to at least one, if not both of those basins um, that's in the aerial um, being constructed during that time. And that is, is really a time when we would expect freeboard to be um, a requirement um, of, of you know, in the design standards. And so these may be basins based on age that, that we would be able to, to retrofit because they should have been, been constructed with that freeboard. Uh, and then lastly is this potential rainfall capture um, idea. So the potential rainfall capture is um, a rainfall depth that could fall across the entire drainage area of a basin that could then be held in that basin without any release. Uh, Clearly basins don't work that way. So it's, it's a theoretical number, uh, but we take the, the storage volume in a basin and divide that by the area and then uh, multiplying by 12 to, to output an inch um, value. Uh, again, what we're targeting here is a potential rainfall capture that is greater than one inch uh, would be an indicator that there would uh, likely be adequate freeboard in the basin at Q100 if that potential rainfall capture value is closer to two inches, uh, then we would, um, you know, we would feel even more confident that it is uh, absolutely a basin that is likely to retro, uh, be able to be retrofit. Uh, we also then um, look towards uh, if basins have suitable engineered spillways uh, and or what their downstream safety risks are. And so defining an engineered spillway, uh, Bob, Bob talked about this a bit uh, previously, but basically it's a secondary flow route. Um, it is separate from the box structure culvert channel discharge that is um, like the main, you know, the main route of discharge from a basin. So it's a secondary flow route uh, that is designed to safely manage overtopping events. Uh, the, the photo on the left here has rock um, and, and I think even a concrete bottom. It's definitely a much more um, 
man-made or engineered, if you will, spillway. Um, and the basin on the, the right is, is a grassed spillway. Um, so it can, it can really range in materials. Uh, and then knowing um, you know, what makes an, an engineered spillway suitable, uh, it, it can be challenging to, to understand this just looking um, you know, through GIS or, or Google Earth aerials. Um, but basically, we would look um, to see if, if there is a, a, a spillway that's visible by the naked eye um, in the imagery. And here on the right, we didn't see, we didn't see that spillway uh, in the aerial. We didn't see rock. We didn't see uh, you know, concrete, um, really anything that would indicate a, a clear designed flow path. Um, and on the left, uh, this is um, armoring that's undermined. This is clearly not something you could see just uh, from Google or GIS aerials, but um, if you are visiting basins, or, or have other supplemental information that could indicate something like this, uh, then these would be um, indicators that the engineered spillway uh, is, is not suitable, at least you know, not with some, without some maintenance. Uh, and then we also look towards uh, what the downstream safety risks are. Um, and when, when we're doing this, we, we consider what the risks would be if the berm were to blow out, you know, that's holding back the water that's creating that basin. Uh, so where would the water go as it flows downstream? Uh, are there residences downstream? In the, in the left image here, we see that there's a house just across the street from this basin. Uh, and if that berm were to blow out, you know, would it send a wall of water down to that house? Uh, that is clearly a safety risk um, in that instance. Uh, we can also look if there are roadways downstream or um, often we see them right at the top of the berm of the embankment. This middle image, um, that basin is actually sitting down in a valley and they built up the road around it. And so uh, if that road were to overtop and, and um, wash out, I think we've all seen you know, images of washed out roads from flooding events. Uh, you can understand how catastrophic that could be. Um, and then lastly, we want to, um, if we can, you know, think about if the berm might be made of fill or if it's uh, really carved out of the natural topography um, as, as a fill berm um, could be uh, you know, less stable um, with continual uh, ponding and, and uh, you know, pressure on that berm. So once we've, we've kind of evaluated both the, the adequate freeboard and the, the engineered spillway and safety risks, uh, we can um, evaluate those basins that, that rank out for um, simple restriction style uh, retrofits. These um, are another low cost tool. Uh, they are in the range of say $1,000 to $10,000, uh, depending on uh, exactly what, um, what style of retrofit you use. Uh, and they, they provide a high benefit for the, the watershed. So when we say simple restriction style outlets, uh, we mean restrictor plates, riser extensions, uh, and other you know, manufactured devices. On the left are some restrictor plates that were installed on an outlet structure. Uh, the lower um, restrictor plate is actually installed on a head wall that had a culvert that tied into the box. Uh, we were able to reduce the size of that culvert um, with that restrictor plate. And then you can also see some, some plates that are on the box itself, uh, the top plate uh, reducing the size of that window and the lower plate actually um, plating across the entire um, window that spanned the, the length of the box or the width of the box. Uh, the, the middle photo here is of a riser extension. Uh, this actually, um, uh, the, the box had, um, it was very short and it just had these windows um, in it. And so by raising that, um, the elevation of those windows and, and adding some new windows, we were actually able to um, hold a lot more water back in the basin. Uh, really this riser extension was only um, a possibility because the original structure uh, sat so low in the ground uh, compared to the top of the berm of the basin. Uh, this isn't really an option on all basins. If that um, top of structure and top of berm are pretty close to each other, uh, then you'd probably not want to go the route of a, a riser extension. Um, 
And then lastly, there are uh, manufactured devices and uh, I won't um, belabor this too much, but Bob touched on the detain H2O insert with our, uh, with the case study that he presented earlier. Uh, so once we've done these, you know, we've, we've evaluated our basins for these two, uh, the low hanging fruit, these, these early off ramps, uh, we still may need um, a few more, you know, options to really move the needle in the stream. And so we look towards uh, finding large basins that could intercept a large portion of a watershed's impervious area. Uh, so uh, really what we mean by large basin or large, large portion of impervious area will be watershed dependent. Uh, here um, is Ward Creek, which is one of the, the case studies that we'll present um, later in this presentation. Uh, we, we can see that this one pond, the President's Park uh, pond, actually, uh, you know, it intercepts 65% of the total watershed uh, and, and um, 32% um, of the impervious uh, in the watershed, you know, drains to this basin. Uh, if we were able to retrofit that, it would control so much of the watershed uh, that um, we would really expect to see some, some great benefits to the downstream part. Uh, you know, depending on, on the results that you're finding, you may want to uh, set some limits such as 10% of the total sub-watershed drainage area, um, or you may just sort of play it by ear um, and, and evaluate based on um, the needs of the watershed. Uh, so we don't have clear um, hard and fast rules on what this means, um, and it will just, it will be kind of dependent on each watershed. Uh, so for those large basins, uh, this is when we would consider the costs and benefits of some uh, expensive retrofits. This may be um, you know, expanding the storage, uh, providing some spillway upgrades, or um, it could be other tools such as real-time control. Uh, both of these come with high, high price tags, um, and I'll, I'll go over them a bit on the next slide. Uh, but with those higher costs, uh, we would expect to see, and, and they would be beneficial uh, because they have a very high benefit for the, the watershed and the receiving streams. So a few options for expensive retrofits uh, would be basically an overhaul of the basin that could include excavation to expand the grading or expand the storage. Uh, you could add in some under drains, you know, um, upgrade the, the spillway, add a new outlet structure, uh, you know, it, and it would depend on what the um, the, the limitations of the site are. Uh, for, say, a moderately sized basin, this might range uh, between ten dollars to $50,000. And on the right here um, is, is a kind of schematic of what real-time control uh, may look like. There is a valve that sits in the outlet structure uh, within the pond, and then a control panel uh, that operates that valve. Uh, the control panel can also sense the weather, it does uh, forecasting, and so that in advance of a storm event, uh, the, the valve could open and water could be pumped out of a basin. Uh, and then during that storm event, uh, the water would raise back to the level, um, kind of the normal pool or that permanent pool level um, again. Uh, Real-time control is definitely an investment and can be between $25,000 and $100,000 uh, for um, you know, installation and then um, with the weather forecasting and, and the um, kind of com computer side that goes with it, there are annual fees uh, that can be in, say, the ten to twenty thousand dollar range, uh, and that's why we're really looking for these types of retrofits and only um, those that control a large portion of the watershed um, and a large portion of that impervious area. Uh, we really want to make that investment worth it. And then, as I said, you know, there may be basins that don't rank out as, as being um, candidates for V-notch weirs, restriction retrofits, or um, even expensive retrofits. And we just want to catalog these for later. Um, again, they may have uh, the ability to be retrofit with just um, a little more cost, maybe a little less benefit, uh, but they may also just be basins that we were not able to generate um, information on for, for one reason or another. Uh, and so um, we'll kind of keep those on their own list and, and revisit them uh, as, as needed and as, as possible um, to sort of um, 
you know, move those forward uh, in, the, in the way that, that uh, may be warranted at that time. Uh, and with that, I am going to take um, another pause. We'll answer some questions uh, if anyone has any on, on the decision tree um, itself and, and what I walked through. And then uh, um, I will be kind of turning it over to Shelby for the next, uh, the next part. Yeah, thanks, Nora. And if anyone needs a, a bladder break, feel free to take it. We're going to answer a few questions. Um, I can't actually see the chat, but if somebody wants to read those questions um, uh, and uh, we'll get through the questions and then uh, Shelby will start with the with the kind of looking at the pilot watersheds, how we how we develop those. I don't um, see any questions in the chat yet. So if you have questions, uh, please enter them in the chat or raise your hand and unmute. Awesome. Well, don't uh, don't don't hesitate to to go take a quick bathroom break. Um, we'll just give you another minute or so. Um, if anyone thinks of a question, just go for it. And um, Shelby is going to request control to operate the slides. I'm going to approve that. If I can get my mouse over there. And uh, go ahead. We do have a raised hand from Roy Larrick. Roy, feel free to unmute. Okay, thank you. I have a quick question. The um, examples of uh, orifices uh, came from, uh, it seems to be um, detention basins. They had, they had no water in them. I, I take it that that's just how you could illustrate uh, excellent conditions. Exactly. Yeah, it's a little bit easier to see it with with the dry basin, uh, the full okay. outlet. But yeah, that and you'll see that in the examples. Y you know, we can have a restriction style uh, retrofit opportunity on a wet basin. This this um, this area right this this node right here. Uh, even if you don't, if you have a wet basin where you can't lower the pool, the permanent pool with a Vinosh weir, for example you still have wet basins that have opportunities for restriction style outlets. Um, so, you know, still, still could have some low cost opportunities. Thank you. Another good question. Thank you, Roy. It'd be very boring if we didn't have any questions. So I appreciate you, you, you uh, asking those. Um, all right, I'm going to hand it over to Shelby and um, she's going to go through kind of how we um, looked at um, finding some some opportunities for um, pilot applications of the tool. And Shelby needs to unmute herself and I'm going to mute myself. Sorry, I couldn't um, unmute myself when I had control. Okay. Am I back on? Okay. So before we go into our pilot um, sub watersheds, it's important to apply the lessons that we've learned from previous basin retrofit studies. So we found a strong correlation between certain levels of control and the generation of geomorphic recovery, um, such as approximately 25 to 50% of the watershed's total impervious area should be effectively or optimally managed by SCMs and approximately five to 10% of the watershed's total drainage area should be effectively or optimally managed by SCMs. And by effectively or optimally, I mean, um, you know, these basins are actually like holding back flow and you know, doing, doing what we're trying to get them to do with these retrofits, not just, um, you know, the um, conventional um, basins that don't hold back that uh, Q critical. Um, and these uh, levels of control could be more or less depending on watershed condition or the imperviousness of the drainage areas, um, but it is a good baseline goal to strive to achieve. Um, 
It's also important to note that the age of the basins can be an indicator of the potential for highly economical retrofits. Um, so the timing of development and thus the basin age is correlated with adequate freeboard. Um, and again, this will vary by community depending on when basin design criteria were updated um, to require a greater depth of freeboard. But if you know the years in which um, the community certain design criteria, such as requiring um, one foot or greater freeboard in the 100 year storm were enacted. Those years can be used as a metric to quickly identify sub watersheds that may have a large quantity of potentially highly economical retrofit opportunities. Oops. Okay, great. So if we look at the change in impervious area between 2001 and 2016, you can see the increases in the perimeter of the greater Cleveland area along the I-271 corridor between Cleveland and Akron, as well as increases in and around smaller municipalities throughout the club area. And if we look at a map of the increases in impervious area between 2001 and 2016 by HUC-12, you can see these patterns repeated with larger increases. Um, in the greater Cleveland area and along that I-271 corridor, as well as sporadic areas of higher increases throughout the club program area. And as you can see, um, 90 of the HUC 12s or 58% um, had an increase of impervious area between zero and 0.5%, 0 .5%. Um, 29 or 19% um, had an increase of 0.5 to 1%. Um, 20 or 13% of the HUC 12s had an increase of 1 to 2%, and then um, 11 had an increase of 2 to 3%, and then only 4 HUC 12s or 3% of the total HUC 12s um, had an increase of 3 to 5.5% in previous area. So using these observations together with recommendations from the club membership, we identified seven potential pilot hub 12s, and these are Hyder Ditch, Frontal Lake Erie, French Creek, Town of Willoughby, Chagrin River, McFarland Creek, Aurora Branch, Rocky River, Baker Creek, West Branch, Rocky River, and City of Norwalk. And from those seven, we narrowed our pilot hub 12s down to three. And those are Town of Willoughby, Chagrin River, which has a large amount of older development and has documented erosion issues in Ward Creek. Um, and then Baker Creek West Branch Rocky River, which had a 3.2 increase in impervious area between 2001 and 2016. And French Creek, which had a 5.4% increase in impervious area between 2001 and 2016. So um, Town of Willoughby Chagrin River, um, this HUC 12 was recommended for analysis by um, club partners. Um, the majority of its development appears to have taken place before 2001, and it has a relatively large number of older basins. So in 2001, the total impervious area was 28.5%. In 2016, the um, total impervious area was 33 30.3% um, for an increase of 1.8%, um, which is a relatively modest increase in imperviousness compared to the other um, HOP 12s that we were looking at. Um, but in general, um, you can see the development concentrated in a few hot spots, which are circled in red. So um, here are the cataloged basins within the HOP 12. So we have 141 Lake County stormwater detention basins, 24 uh, basins that are inspected by Lake County, 20 basins cataloged by the town of Willoughby, and then seven Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District RSS basins. All right, our next pilot hub 12 is the Baker Creek West Branch Rocky River. So in 2001, the total impervious area was 16.3%. And that increased to 19.5% in 2016 for an increase of 3.2%. Um, and this is one of the four HUC 12s that had a greater than 3% increase in impervious area. And you know, when you click through the 2001 to 2016 map, you can see you know, how 
much of the basin's drainage area was filled in with development. And here are the areas of concentrated increase in imperviousness. And then the Baker Creek West Branch Rocky River Hub 12 has 111 Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District SCMs and 21 RSS basins catalog within its boundaries. And then our third pilot hub 12 is French Creek. So out of our three chosen pilot hub 12s, French Creek had the greatest increase in imperviousness between 2001 and 2016. Um, in 2001, total impervious area was 11.8% and increased to 17.3% in 2016, which is an increase of 5.4%. Um, and Fringe Creek Watershed is the hub 12 with the largest increase in impervious area between 2001 and 2016 for the entire CLEB project area, um, which makes it such an appealing pilot sub watershed. And again, you know, you can really see the areas of widespread um, increases in imperviousness between the 2001 and 2016 maps. Here are the locations of our most concentrated development. And we have 76 um, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District cataloged SCMs within the French Creek Cut 12. Awesome, thank you, Shelby. Um, uh, again, another quick pause in case anyone has any questions. Um, that was, um, again, like Shelby mentioned, through a, a very collaborative process with partners, um, kind of figuring out how, let's select some pilot applications of the tool that really cover a nice gradient of watersheds in the club area. So we have uh, the Ward Creek um, subwatershed that's got a lot of older development. Um, and then, um, you know, the other two uh, sub watersheds that have a lot, you know, younger development, more recent development, and you'll kind of see the difference in how the tool uh, gets you to different solutions in those various watersheds as we as we walk through our, our pilot analyses. But any questions while I pause for a second? Don't currently see any questions in the chat. Feel free to enter those into the chat if you have them or you can unmute or raise your hand if you have a question. Thank you, Kim. And at any point, um, I'm just filling the dead air here, but feel free to interrupt me. Um, but yeah, we've got, for the next uh, bit of the presentation, we've got our three pilot watersheds, um, and we're gonna walk through the tool. Uh, so give you three nice examples of how you use the tool in these three different pilot watersheds. And these are all basically, we're calling them sub watersheds within those kind of priority uh, watersheds, those priority hooks, again, trying to, um, find some good opportunities for getting at enough retrofit um, basins that cover enough of that impervious area. Again, like Shelby mentioned at the beginning, 25 to 50% of the total impervious area in the basin trying to be effectively managed. So we found three nice sub watersheds within these pilot hucks to, um, to, to walk through the tool on. And um, I'm assuming, go ahead. Still no questions in the chat yet. Thanks, Kim. So uh, we're going to go through the next, uh, the first example here, um, Town of Willoughby, uh, Chagrin River, the Wart Creek subwatershed. Um, so uh, here's, um, I guess, sorry. So this is a picture of uh, Ward Creek. You see, you know, clearly we have some bank erosion issues. Uh, it seems like there's been some historic incision and downcutting. The floodplain's pretty high removed from the channel. Here are two other pictures that we got from, from Kim and, and her, uh, her, her Chagrin River group. Um, this is an, another example where, you know, pretty bad erosive bank looks to be about four to five feet tall, nearly vertical. Um, so not, not a good condition as far as geomorphic stability and equilibrium. This picture is what I mentioned at the very beginning when I was talking about the profile and the distance to a hard point or a base level. So this picture at um, Reeves Road uh, is basically just about 300 feet upstream of the backwater uh, of the uh, of Lake Erie slash um, Chagrin River. And so, you know, because it's so close to that base level, it has no room to downcut. Like the whole system upstream can be downcutting, but right there, there's no room to downcut. 
So this is a great example of what the stream should look like uh, in an equilibrium condition if you're not undergoing that down cutting where you're getting more entrenched, concentrating the energy, leading to bank instability and so forth. So it's kind of a nice, um, we'll call it reference-like condition for this, for this system. Um, we've, um, as I, the re one of the reasons I walked through that background at the beginning is not only is it kind of important to understand the sequence of channel evolution, but at every phase of channel evolution, you will have different rates of down cutting and different rates of widening. And, and so, um, you know, our, our uh, Ward Creek uh, pilot watershed here is, is uh, likely at least the pictures we've seen in the stage three condition where it's had some historic down cutting, it's got some continued widening and bank erosion, and it doesn't really have a lot of bars building up yet. So we'll call it stage three. So in the stage three condition, we get a lot of widening anywhere between, you know, five to 20, even, you know, 40 plus centimeters per year of widening. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, can some continued down cutting up to maybe 10 centimeters per year of, of down cutting, for example, in the stage three. Um, once you get to stage four, uh, this is a really important point. You know, say we retrofit enough of these basins to induce a transition to, you know, the bank fails, instead of the sediment being washed away, it starts to aggrade and, you know, hopefully stay stable long enough to get colonized by vegetation and very quickly get to the stage five, right? It's really important to understand that at that transition, you're still going to see some, some bank failure simply by the nature of the banks being geotechnically unstable to begin with right now. So without physical manipulation of these banks, these vertical banks that are geotechnically unstable are going to continue to fail. They're gonna, and, and then, um, you know, but the hope is that when they fail, that deposition stays stable, right? So when you, and, and it's again, really important to underscore this, you might have a couple years of being in this stage four where you're building up the toes of the banks, you still have geotechnically unstable banks and you actually see additional widening. Uh, some of our highest rates of widening occur during the stage four phase when those unstable bars can deflect flow into already unstable banks. So, you know, there, there might be some additional widening, uh, will likely be some additional widening if you can kind of flip this switch, but the, the good news is instead of, you know, 50 plus years of additional down cutting and widening, you've only got a, a period of a handful of years of additional widening before those banks, the, before those bars can be colonized by vegetation, right? That's the, that's the whole go, goal here of this um, kind of geomorphic uh, trajectory uh, switching that we're hoping for. So um, walking through the Ward Creek case study here, first step is to identify the wet basins. Uh, in Ward Creek, uh, the, the subwatershed here, we've got um, 95 total basins that shall be found, 52 of them are wet. Um, and then we look at, is, do they have the ability to lower the permanent pool? Um, so on, on some of them, uh, they do, like this, this basin right here where there's a clear concrete structure, you know, uh, uh, obvious ability to, to, to lower that permanent pool at President's Park a pond that has a kind of a call or a, a channel outlet and then kind of ground truth as a, as a culvert, you know, no real economical ability to, to lower that uh, permanent pool, right? You'd have, to, you'd have to grade that entire channel to make it deeper, right? To lower that permanent pool. So, so not a cost-effective way to, to lower that permanent pool. Um, so then, you know, the, the basins that we can lower the permanent pool, we put them in the, the V-notch weir or equivalent category. Uh, we've got nine of those, so nine likely B-notch weir candidates, again, or equivalent. You don't have to use B-notch weir, so that's about 17% of the wet basins. Uh, another important thing, this really underscores the, the kind of rapid nature of the desktop level screening that we're doing. We've got 30 basins where we're saying they're indeterminate. So we, we don't know whether you can lower the permanent pool. We can't tell. We can't see if there's an outlet structure. But you know, if you're out in the field and you're and you're kind of ground truthing this one that is a likely V notch rear candidate, you know, maybe pop over to this one and see, you know, it's an indeterminate basin. Take a look at that one and see if you can get more information to you know put that basin back in the in the V notch rear category. So 
uh, again, kind of thinking strategically about, you know, the level of field work and kind of maybe some of these bases that are indeterminate at the desktop level, but they could be good opportunities based on the, the amount of in, impervious area they intercept, for example. So it's worth taking a look. Um, adequate freeboard at the 100 year to restrict the low flow. Um, uh, this basin, um, as Shelby mentioned, you know, in the overall huck, the impervious area increased 1.8% uh, between 2001 and 2016. Uh, in the Ward Creek sub-watershed that we're looking at, that increase was a, a 2%. Um, so, um, you know, that's, so we do have some recent, more recent basins that are likely to have some, some uh, decent free board. And then we also are gonna look at the potential rainfall capture. So uh, looking at uh, drainage areas and, uh, and, and storage volume. So here's our drainage areas. Um, you know, uh, again, look to that uh, module for how to delineate a drainage area. Um, but you know, we got several that drain more than, um, uh, or several, several basins that, that have more than 10 acre feet of uh, volume. So, so pretty good uh, amounts of volume. And then when you divide the basin volume, by the drainage area, the drainage area in acres, the basin volume in acre feet, uh, and then you convert it to inches, uh, we have 16 basins that have more than two inches of what we're calling potential rainfall capture. So, so those basins uh, in kind of dark blue seem to be really good candidates just based on how much volume they have relative to their drainage area for simple restriction style uh, retrofits. Um, we got another 14 basins that have between one and two inches. So another good sign that those basins are pretty large, probably large enough to, to have some decent freeboard. And then 45 less than one inch and then 20 that are indeterminate. The indeterminate basically means that the, our, our, the basin's construction was later than the available DEM contours. So the contours aren't really showing us a basin, even though we see a basin in um, in, in, in aerial. And so that's another example where if it's a recent basin, maybe you can get the drawings and, and then you know, have a better idea on free board and maybe some of these indeterminate basins get kicked into the simple retrofit restriction style uh, retrofit candidate. Also looking at suitable engineer spillway and, and downstream safety risks. Um, so we've got 19 basins with what, what appears to be adequate freeboard based on these screening level metrics. Of course, this needs to be uh, verified by the design engineer at the time of uh, you know, design and implementation. But 19 with adequate freeboard based on the approximate year of construction, uh, another 26 based on um, potential rainfall capture depth. So we got a nice uh, handful of basins that you know, we see that are likely to have some adequate freeboard um, and that sort of underscores um, some of the points from the Chagrin River folks of, you know, every basin is a little different, even though these basins, many of which predated 2000, you know, they seem to have uh, enough storage volume and relative to their drainage area to um, have uh, likely adequate freeboard for uh, restrictions. Um, and then we got... Um, uh, 42 basins with no apparent screening level risks to downstream infrastructure in terms of, you know, safety. Uh, and so, you know, um, so that gets us into this bucket of the simple restriction style outlets, um, uh, retrofits, the, you know, one to $10,000 uh, retrofit options. Um, so we got 26 low flow restriction candidates um, identified here. And, um, you know, and then kind of moving through the tool, uh, you know, next, next question is, um, uh, you know, they didn't fall out in this bucket or this bucket. So are they a large basin that intercepts a large portion of the drainages and pervious area? And so here's, um, here, th this is a really nice example of, uh, of a watershed with a lot of old development, but it still has a lot of its area being intercepted by basins. Uh, some of those, I think four of those are, really, are what we call inline basins. Um, President's Park being one of them, intercepting 4,000 acres out of the total 5,400 acres of total drainage area in the subwatershed. So pretty uh, influential basin there. 86% uh, of the total imperviousness gets routed into uh, basins. And so uh, we're going to evaluate um, whether any of them could be worth pursuing expensive retrofits, whether that's 
increase grading or increase storage by grading or, or real-time control. And we've got four that um, you know, appear to drain a large enough area and a large enough imperviousness in a various part of the network to, that could be worth kind of doing some more expensive retrofits. And so three of them here in series, so Presidents Park, um, one by, I'm not exactly sure, but maybe commercial development, and then one maybe by more residential. But anyway, these inline basins could all potentially be designed in series so that you know, you're kind of minimizing overtopping risks of each basin while maximizing total best performance to the downstream network, for example. So, so just one example of kind of the more expensive but impactful, um, you know, large basin retrofits. And then, you know, our tier three, our lower priority, um, you know, being cataloged for uh, later valuation that could also include uh, getting more information that was indeterminate at the desktop level to maybe put a couple of these basins down here back into these different buckets for simple retrofits. And so kind of overall, the, um, the pilot area results, uh, 46 catalog for later. Um, but then looking at the complete tool results here, we got our V-notch weirs. Uh, we have some overlapping V-notch weir and restriction style candidates. Um, we have our, our four or so expensive candidates. And then our yellow dots are our restriction style candidates. And so just summarizing them here, the Venn diagram, seven V-notch weirs, uh, two V-notch weirs that could also be the restriction style outlet restriction, like Roy got to earlier with that, that question about whether wet basin could still be restricted. Uh, so that's that. those are two there, 24 restriction style, and then four potential expensive retrofits. We think we found 12 that were probably not designed for stormwater control, like old farm ponds, and then 46 catalog for later. Again, maybe you get more information on those and, and can revisit those uh, with more information. So let's look at our total area controlled, total impervious controlled by these different types of retrofits. So in this, this subwatershed, we've got 5% of the total imperviousness uh, captured by these V-notch weir candidates. So, and again, keep in mind that we're trying to get to about 25 to 50% of the total impervious area being controlled by these, by retrofit or, you know, optimized basis. So, so we're de a decent chunk, 5% uh, by the V-notch weirs. Uh, the restriction style candidates, though, get us to 11% 11, uh, uh, 11 on their own, and they largely are different from our, our um, V-notch weirs. So, you know, you're basically, uh, you know, 11 plus 5 or so, so you're about 15% of the total drainage areas and perviousness being controlled by these simple, low-cost retrofits. But to get to that 25 to 50% of the basin effectively managed, you probably in this watershed need to look at some of these larger uh, you know, inline basins. And so uh, if, you, if you look at all four of them, they control 79% of the total impervious area. And again, that could be, you know, a combination of looking at these three in line as a series, maybe some of those simple cost-effective ones upstream also help to kind of hold back water so that you're not uh, exacerbating overtopping risks down here. Uh, again, more of the detailed design phase, but it shows you kind of how, how creative you need to be in some of these older basins uh, where you need to kind of look to more expensive, um, you know, retrofits for the for those bigger to get to that target of 25 to 50 percent of the impervious area. Um, quick pause. Um, I think we're doing okay on time. So quick pause for uh, again. If you need to take a bladder break, that's okay. Um, if you have any questions on Ward Creek, uh, we will be sharing all these detailed results in GIS form. Um, uh, you know. For, um, uh, for, for folks to use. But any, any questions on Ward Creek while we uh, take this quick pause? Put them yet in the chat. So again, enter your questions into the chat or just unmute yourself or raise your hand. And then if you, know, if you felt like I was going too fast, I, I was trying to get us back on time, but also um, we got two more, two more examples where we're walking through the tool here. It's Roy Larrick again, and I have a, a simple question. Uh, the President's Basin, President's Park, is such a large basin along uh, the Lakeland Freeway, Ohio 2, that uh, it's noticeable. And can anyone tell me why 
there was no freeboard there. It seems to be so deep as you drive by it. What's the freeboard limitation? I believe, and Shelby, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but based on our analysis, it's at the downstream end where the, the culvert and channel outlet are, uh, that on the highway side of the basin, it seems there is there is a very large hill uh, up to the highway um, that makes you know the basin seem so deep, but it's actually at the downstream end uh, that doesn't provide you know the same level of embankment on the downstream end that there is on the upstream end. Okay. Yes, I don't know that outlet end. Thank you. But that is a fantastic question, Roy, because it gets at the idea of it's a big enough basin that intercepts enough drainage area and imperviousness that maybe it's worth building up that berm, right? Or doing some sort of real-time control. Like it, it controls so much of the drainage area that it's worth kind of evaluating those creative solutions on that larger uh, facility. Thank you. We do have a question in the chat. Um, Jared has asked, uh, what is the basis for the 25 to 50% target for impervious surface control? Uh, great question. So, uh, and we put this in the guidance uh, document as well. You know, we, we don't know the magic number for how much area, impervious area, you have to effectively manage to induce that geomorphic response. As, as Shelby and Nora mentioned, you know, it's a, it depends on so many factors, like the total imperviousness of the watershed, the channel evolution state, uh, how many hard points the channel might have, so many different factors. Whether there's a riparian corridor or not really influences the vegetation strength and the wood loading, right? So there's a lot of factors that are going to make that number kind of different for every watershed. But what we've seen on our first pilot applications is we've been able to flip that switch in terms of inducing a geomorphic recovery at about that 25 to 50% of the impervious area effectively managed. Uh, that also coincided with about five to 10% of the total drainage area. So it's not a hard and fast rule. And what we, one of the things we conclude on in this training and the, and the document is we really encourage folks who do these retrofits to make sure they do some monitoring so that we can, and that monitoring can be very simple like photographs, but we really need to kind of try, uh, monitor, and then kind of report back to the broader community to see, all right, well, in this basin, we got there with maybe 20% of the impervious area controlled, or in this basin, you know, it took to get to 45% of the impervious area control to be, you know, effective. So that's, that's why it's such a broad range. And it's really not a, it's just kind of a, a benchmark. It's not, it's not really um, a hard number uh, by any stretch. Bob, uh, there are no other questions in the chat right now. Awesome. I'm going to mute myself and Shelby is going to go with our second case study. All right, great. Yeah, so now we're moving on to our second pilot sub watershed, which is called the unnamed tributary to West Branch Rocky River. Um, and it is in the Baker Creek West Branch Rocky River Hub 12. There we go. All right, so our first step in the decision tree is to identify whether a basin is a wet or retention basin. Um, so out of the 58 basins that were identified, um, 34 of those were wet basins. So next, um, we had to investigate our identified wet basins to see if they were potential candidates for lowering the permanent pool the V-notch weir. Um, and remember, when looking for a potential V-notch weir candidate, we are looking for a wet basin in which you can see a concrete structure such as this. <clears throat> and here are um, some examples from our um, pilot sub-watershed. Here are two examples of V-notch weir candidates, potentially. Um, and as you can see, you can clearly make out the concrete box structures within the pond. Um, but if you look at this one over here, while it is a wet basin, it has a culvert outlet. And again, you can't um, construct a V-notch weir or equivalent retrofit using a culvert outlet. Um, yeah, and then we evaluate um, 
those basins that we identified for VNOTCH wear or equivalent retrofit. Um, and again, here is our example. Here's our existing control structure and our permanent pool elevation. And then we cut our VNOTCH wear into it. The permanent pool lowers, thus um, increasing the storage volume in the basin. So out of our 34 wet basins, um, nine were identified as likely VNOTCH wear candidates and 14 um, are classified as indeterminate VNOTCH wear candidates. Um, and with the indeterminate candidates, we just couldn't definitively verify the presence or absence of a concrete structure that could be used for this style of retrofit, which as we've said, doesn't mean that they're just immediately removed from the list, uh, but they will require some ground truthing um, to see if they have a suitable structure. And again, um, these are all um, the candidacy of these basins are dependent upon stakeholder willingness to lower the permanent pool elevation and other feasibility factors. All right, and so the next step in our decision tree is to identify whether there was adequate freeboard in the 100 year storm elevation to restrict low flow. So many drawings and stormwater calculations were not available. So we used the age of the basin slash recent imperviousness and the potential rainfall capture depth as metrics to assess whether there was adequate freeboard. Um, and this specific pilot sub watershed had a total impervious cover um, increase from 2001 to 2016 of 7%. So we recognize that the potential to identify basins from newer development um, that might have a greater likelihood of having that adequate freeboard was um, pretty reasonably high. Um, so in order to calculate the potential rainfall capture depth, we need to know the volume and the drainage area of the basin. So here is our map depicting the basin volumes throughout the sub watershed. As you can see, there are several basins whose volume um, we were unable to calculate due to insufficient or outdated contour files. Um, but then the volumes that we were able to calculate, they range anywhere from less than one acre feet to we have um, a few basins that whose volumes exceed 10 acre feet. So from our potential rainfall capture depth analysis, um, we found 21 basins that had indeterminate rainfall capture, and that's because we weren't able to calculate the volume. But then there are 18 basins um, whose rainfall capture depths were greater than one inch, which, as we've discussed, is a pretty good benchmark um, to identify adequate um, freeboard. So next we had to analyze whether the basins had a suitable engineered spillway and whether they posed any threat to downstream infrastructure in the case that they overtopped. And so from these analyses, uh, we found that 36, per 36 of our basins um, potentially had adequate freeboard in the 100 year storm using the metric of basin age. Um, and to, to estimate basin age, we used Google Earth's historical aerial images to estimate the years in which each basin was constructed. And then we identified 15 basins um, that had adequate freeboard based on potential rainfall capture depth. Um, and again, these feasibility factors um, such as freeboard and adequate spillway um, need to be evaluated during detailed design. And then um, we identified 27 basins that had no apparent screening level risks to downstream infrastructure. And again, overtopping risks need to be evaluated by a design engineer um, in further detail. So using the presence of adequate freeboard and suitable engineered spillway and or the lack of threat posed to downstream infrastructure, we need to evaluate um, for a simple retro restriction style retrofit. Um, and we found 19 um, bases that are potential low flow restriction style candidates. Um, so that means that a third of the basins in this pilot sub watershed were potential candidates for simple, effective and economical retrofits. So after that, we uh, looked for basins that intercepted large areas of the sub watershed that could serve as potential candidates for more expensive retrofit options. So first, let's take a closer look at the current level of control within the sub watershed. So currently, 
43% of the total subwatershed drainage area is controlled by basins and 54% of the total impervious area is controlled by the basins, um, which is you know, a pretty promising place to start. So after we identify the basins with large drainage areas, we need to investigate the costs and benefits of these more expensive retrofit options. So out of our basins, we identified two with large drainage areas that could be candidates for expensive retrofits. So it's important to note that while these basins only represent 4% of the subwatershed's total basins, they control 12% of the total drainage area and 18% of the impervious area. So that's huge. Um, and they're both at the top of the watershed, which means that if they get retrofitted, um, these benefits such as reduction in erosion and extended base flow would be felt throughout the downstream reaches. And then um, the basins that didn't clearly fit into any other categories get cataloged for later. So while 23 uh, basins got cataloged for later, this doesn't mean that they're immediately removed from the opportunity list. They're just saved for later opportunities that might be more appropriate for them. And here are our complete tool results for the unnamed tributary to West Branch Rocky River. So immediately you can see um, a lot of our yellow um, restriction style outlet retrofits and then uh, our notch weirs, and then a combination of restriction and expensive and a restriction and notch. Here's our Venn diagram. Uh, we have a total of 19 restriction style candidates, two of which are also our expensive retrofit candidates, and another three are also notch weir candidates. And then we have an additional seven notch weir candidates um, that are only notch weir candidates. <clears throat> And then we identified nine basins that were likely not for stormwater control. So these farm ponds or just aesthetic backyard koi ponds. Um, and then 23 basins that were cataloged for later. So taking a closer look at the potential benefits of our VDOT weir candidates. So in total, these basins control 4% of the subwatershed drainage area and 6% of the total impervious area of the subwatershed. So while these do fall short of that level of control metric that we've talked about, um, these still would move the needle in the positive direction um, for the watershed if they, if they were built. Um, and then looking at our potential low flow restriction benefits. Um, so these candidates control a um, total of 23% of the subwatershed drainage area and 36% of the total impervious area. So that's pretty promising, um, you know, that level of control is there. And then our expensive retrofit candidates, which we've discussed before, um, those two control 12% of the total drainage area and 18% of the total imperviousness. Um, and again, it's important to note that these two basins are also restriction style retrofit candidates, um, you know, that are impactful and cost-effective in their own right, but if for some reason these basins aren't able to be retrofitted with that simple restriction, um, their large drainage areas make them potentially ideal candidates for high cost and high benefit uh, retrofits. Okay. Thank you, Shelby. Uh, any questions um, uh, before we move on to the last pilot watershed with Norm? in the chat yet. Okay. All right. Um, we will, uh, Nora will have a similar amount of time on that. And then, um, and, and then we can take another pause if, you have, if there's any questions on these um, case studies. All right. Uh, here we go, the last one. Uh, the third pilot area that we looked at is called the Jung Bluth Ditch Subwatershed. And this is part of the uh, French Creek Cup 12. So again, we um, are looking to identify the basins and, and of those which are um, wet or retention basins as our initial step uh, of the tool. We see 51 basins identified in this subwatershed. And of those 51, 23 of them uh, were identified as wet basins. <clears throat> 
we then uh, looked at those specific wet basins uh, to understand their potential ability to lower the permanent pool. Um, again, we see some examples here, uh, three different basins from the subwatershed. On the image on the left, there's actually two basins. So the lower, uh, the lower left basin, um, we see the outlet structure clearly there, um, and it is considered a candidate. Uh, I especially like this one for a V notch weir because it um, is behind a commercial development, and you can see that it's clearly uh, well vegetated around the entire perimeter, such that um, you know it, I view it unlikely that a a owner would have a concern about aesthetics from from lowering the water surface a bit, uh, and, and obviously you'd have to reach out to them, but um, it's uh, just kind of what I take away from looking at this. Uh, there's a second basin in that image kind of slightly outlined. Uh, we, um, you know, looked at several different aerials, both in GIS and um, Google Earth for this basin. And we also uh, dropped into Street View and we just couldn't see the, the outlet structure. And so uh, this is one of those that we would classify as indeterminate at this point. Uh, um, due to their, you know, its proximity to the basin next to it, you know, it would be a, an easy little trip to uh, visit that and see what that outlet structure looks like, um, you know, if you're visiting that, that lower basin in that image. Uh, the image on the right is, um, you know, in a, say, apartment or, or condo complex. Uh, you can see it's kind of highly manicured, but it also has a culvert outlet. And so this basin, um, due to that culvert outlet, did not rank as a V notch weir candidate. So the basins that um, we were able to identify um, their outlet structures, uh, we would be able to evaluate for a V-notch weir retrofit. Uh, and here is a map. There's actually only three uh, basins in the watershed uh, that, that were identified as likely V-notch weir candidates uh, from this analysis. Uh, there were another nine that were uh, considered indeterminate. As I look at the map, I see that they are all uh, pretty well clustered together, such that um, a trip out to the watershed you know, would be a perfect Friday afternoon activity uh, to go peek at some outlet structures and see uh, if you could gather a little more information on those uh, to further populate um, the, the results. Uh, next, then we would look for adequate freeboard at Q100 to restrict the low flow. Uh, we used, um, we kind of looked at all the screening level metrics. Uh, we did not have drawings or stormwater calculations available. This, um, as a reminder, was that HUP 12 that had the most development, um, you know, from 2001 to 2016 at 5.4%. And uh, as we dialed into this specific sub watershed, we actually saw a 10.5% increase in impervious area um, during, you know, the 2001 to, to six, 2016 uh, data ranges. And so, uh, you know, we feel like there's probably plenty of basins that will hit that um, adequate freeboard requirement. And then lastly, we did look at the potential rainfall capture. Uh, to calculate the potential rainfall capture, we got those drainage areas and storage volumes. Uh, they ranked, um, you know, all the way from indeterminate up to greater than um, that 10 acre feet for, for storage. Uh, I also find um, it really interesting as I look at this that many of the basins are um, kind of more in the headwaters and, and on the um, you know, kind of southeast uh, side of, of the watershed. Um, just sort of an, an interesting point that um, any results kind of we'd, we'd expect to see trickle throughout the rest of the downstream reaches. Uh, so um, using the the drainage areas and the storage volumes, we calculated potential rainfall capture depths, uh, and we had actually over 50% of the basins that had at least one inch of potential rainfall capture, uh, or, or 27 total basins. Then uh, we looked at the um, basins for suitable engineered spillway and what the, the downstream safety risks may be. Uh, and the next couple slides will just distill um, kind of all the information from, from both the freeboard and the um, downstream safety risks. So as we um, looked for adequate freeboard, there were 24 basins in the subwatershed that based on the approximate year of construction, uh, we would um, assume that they have adequate freeboard. 
uh, there are 17 basins within the subwatershed uh, that appear to have adequate freeboard based on that um, potential rainfall capture. Uh, and then uh, lastly, there are 17 basins that do not appear to have um, screening level risks for their downstream infrastructure. So we take uh, those last three slides uh, and we uh, distill them down to come up with uh, which basins should should have uh, be or should be evaluated for their uh, a simple restriction style retrofit. And so in this sub watershed, uh, it works out that there are 15 uh, candidates uh, for low flow restriction retrofits. Uh, again, um, you know, you'd need to say meet with the property owners and, and get their takes on uh, you know, if they were open to these, these retrofits, but um, that's a pretty great um, place to start is, is 15 uh, to have on the list. Uh, for those that didn't rank out as a v notch weir um, or a simple ret restriction style, uh, and even maybe some that do, we also looked to see how many large basins there were that, that had large drainage areas and large impervious uh, amounts that were intercepted. So in this subwatershed, 55% uh, of the drainage area in the in entire subwatershed is intercepted by basins. Uh, to me, this isn't surprising, more than 50% when we see that there is so much uh, recent development over the course of the last, say, 20 years. Uh, you know, these same uh, basins collect 67% of the impervious area. Uh, and again, you can really see in this graphic how they're um, in, in more of the headwaters than in the downstream reaches uh, by implementing them kind of more on this headwater side, we would expect to see those results um, trickle through all the downstream reaches. Uh, so uh, I, I, I wouldn't want anyone to look at the map and be dismayed that they there are no basins on the um, more northern portion of this, this sub-watershed, uh, you know, we would expect these, um, any results to kind of trickle all the way down there. Uh, so we evaluated um, the largest basins um, and identified those uh, for expensive retrofit potential. Uh, and in this basin, that actually works out to be a whopping eight uh, candidates. That seems uh, like a pretty large number um, to tackle, but there are several that are in line uh, that potentially wouldn't, you know, do all of them. You could do uh, one or two to receive many of the benefits if, if that is um, the desired route. Uh, I also want to draw your attention. There is a basin right in the middle uh, that is a red dot that is not for stormwater uh, management as far as we could tell uh, presently. However, uh, this is an expensive retrofit. You know, some of the options are to install new, or in this case, maybe for the first time, install an outlet structure uh, and, and potentially regrade or add a spillway. Um, and so when you're in the, the realm of expensive retrofits, uh, you know, the, the benefits may be there to uh, actually take a basin that is, is in existence, but is not designed for stormwater management and work to make it um, a stormwater management basin. Again, provided the, the stakeholders are, are on board with that. And, uh, and the other kind of feasibility, uh, you know, it works out. Uh, so then lastly, we cataloged uh, several basins uh, for later uh, reevaluation. And that um, includes, includes nine basins for this sub watershed. So our complete tool, um, I think the, the basins that are not for stormwater management really stand out on this graphic uh, and they are shown in brown. Most of those are around the outskirts or the boundary of the subwatershed, and they seem to be um, parts of um, agricultural fields. Uh, what I would say about these is that, uh, you know, provided development continues in this watershed, especially um, sort of expected at the rate that we've over the past 20 years, we would, um, it wouldn't surprise me if that continued. Uh, in those cases, it's probably best to work on the front end of any um, development with the designer to uh, design basins that, that are going to target uh, management of stream erosion uh, right on the upfront instead of you know, already getting that in the ground and then, and then knocking on the door to see if we could retrofit it. So uh, you know, I think that's something interesting sort of about this specific example um, that not only are there several opportunities to implement today, but 
we kind of can see maybe where a development will happen in the future and, and get an idea um, about how to work um, from the start on, on basins there uh, to, to help the overall watershed. Uh, combined, we see 23 basins in this sub-watershed that work out to be um, some sort of retrofit candidate. Uh, 15 of those for restriction style, uh, eight of them for expensive retrofits, and three for V-notch weirs, uh, sort of each of those overlapping um, one with another type. Uh, if we think about the number 23 with 51 basins in the, in the total watershed, we've cut the, the total number of basins that could really be evaluated moving forward by over half. And uh, that's really the, the whole idea behind this tool is to quickly evaluate these basins um, and so that you're able to spend that, um, you know, the design money and the uh, detailed analysis money on a more uh, narrow uh, scope and, and really uh, put more of it towards in, in the ground implementation instead of, uh, you know, screening or, or modeling and design by um, engineers. And so uh, also, you know, in this watershed, we talked about um, many that are, are basins not for stormwater control today, um, and also a couple that would be cataloged for later. So uh, dialing back into those results um, and the three V-notch weir retrofits, uh, there is 22% of the impervious area that is intercepted in the subwatershed by these three basins. Um, you can see especially one of those is, is large um, and they could be some really great benefits, uh, but they don't get us quite all the way to our goal. Uh, very few of the uh, same basins that were uh, V-notch are also restriction style. So many of these um, drainage areas do not overlap and we see that there is 27% of the subwatershed impervious area controlled by basins. Uh, between the V-notch weirs and the restriction style retrofits, uh, it's very possible to at least get to about 25% of the impervious um, area, you know, effectively managed by retrofitted basins. Uh, however, if you're, you know, through implementation, not all the way um, able to get there, there are several options for some expensive retrofits uh, that could be also um, implemented uh, a couple of these do overlap with the other alternatives, uh, but these um, combined for 58% of the total impervious area uh, of the watershed. And so, uh, you know, by, by kind of starting with those V-notch, we are in the um, restriction style retrofits that are, are lower cost. Uh, it's likely to kind of get all the way there and then um, should an expensive investment be needed, uh, there are some candidates there um, in this watershed that could kind of hopefully Put, put it over the, the hump, if you will, to um, toward geomorphic recovery. And so um, at this point, before I dive into um, kind of what's next after you use the tool, um, I will pause and, and open it for any questions that uh, you may have on sort of the tool as a whole, any of the pilot analysis that we did, um, you know, or, or anything else that might've popped in your, your mind uh, as we've been going along. Yeah, so uh, while we're waiting for questions, I'll just say um, I thought the selection of pilot watersheds was really, um, really worked out well with the collaborative's input because you saw in the Ward, Ward Creek example, a lot of older development, um, you know, we probably can't get all the way to like our 25 or 50 percent of the impervious area controlled with simple retrofits with V-notch or, or uh, restriction style but there are some opportunities for larger basin uh, retrofits. Um, and whereas with the, the second example and then the third example, you know, you can get, you can get a lot of that impervious area managed with, um, with um, you know, a simple V-notch weir, um, uh, simple V-notch weir restriction style candidates. So anyway, any, uh, any any questions? I don't have any currently in the chat. Cool. Um, well, uh, we're like um, you know forty five minutes or so from the top of the hour. Um, if anyone needs a, a quick bladder break, 
we probably, you know, we have time for that. So, you know, maybe, maybe we'll wait another two minutes or so. And then, um, uh, Nora can, can jump in here, but, um, uh, again, very, very great case studies. And, um, uh, just kind of going back to, uh, Jared's question about, um, you know, that, that kind of target or benchmark goal of trying to effectively manage 25 to 50% of the impervious area in the watershed of interest. Um, you know, there are, um, you know, we, we might be surprised, you know, like in Ward Creek, its development is so old, it might have responded so much already that maybe you only need to do, you know, a dozen or so simple retrofits and that could kind of shift it enough. Or maybe you could do the simple retrofits, complement it with an inline basin retrofit, or maybe some in in uh, in channel hand placed logs, for example, which we'll we'll touch on at the on the end. So, you know, um, it, it it's uh, it's kind of a benchmark for this quick desktop screening, but um, it's it's definitely not you know a, a hard rule. have a raised hand from Myring. Myring, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey guys, uh, great work, great presentation. Um, uh, many a times when you were talking, you were bringing it back to expensive retrofit. I'm just wondering when, you know, because I think you're on the right path here, but one tool that I would like to see added to this, not that you need more stuff added, but if you communicate with the owner, the community, or other ex external partners of what is expensive uh, compared to what, right? So I was just wondering, compared to restoring the upstream or downstream stream sections to reduce erosion and so forth, I think that's that would be good uh, to add to the tool. Well, not well to the conversation for these sub watersheds. Um, is if you can speak to the owner or the community and say, hey, it's. Ten thousand dollars to do this, two hundred fifty thousand to dollars to do that, and it's just going to blow out anyway. So I think that that would be a, a benefit to your conversation uh, for today. Thank you. Hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. Thank you for bringing that point up. When we say expensive retrofits, we're really only saying that relative to the you know simple restriction style or Venus rear retrofits. Uh, when you compare it to the broader a suite of options uh, such as in-stream physical stream restoration with heavy equipment, uh, it, it does not compare at all. Um, you know, cost per foot on kind of suburban stream restoration is typically on the order of about $300 a foot plus or minus can be very expensive in steeper settings with larger drainage areas, can be a lot more expensive than that. So um, when you're looking at the miles of stream you're trying to benefit, and get to that recovery, geomorphic recovery. Uh, typically, the watershed scale controls are the way to go. Um, we have been in some basins where there just aren't enough opportunities for detention basin retrofits to effectively impact the reach of concern. That you know, you got a you got a, a really important uh, asset, infrastructure, or house, hospital, or whatever that you, you probably do need to do some in-stream control, some, some bank bioengineering and so forth to kind of arrest that instability at that problem location. But generally on the whole, um, kind of starting with the, with the flows and trying to throttle them back, uh, like Nora and Shelby were saying, can benefit the whole network as opposed to just a short reach of a, you know, in-stream restoration conventional construction. Um, so great, great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Go ahead, my ring. I think you might have a follow-up question. No, sorry, I might have to drop my hand. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you, Mary. Any other questions? Feel free to pop them in the chat or raise your hand or just unmute to ask your question. Yeah, and, and uh, we've got um, basically um, Nora's got some implementation next step slides. Um, I'm not exactly sure the timing, but and then um, just maybe five minutes of conclusion slides. So we've got plenty of time for questions now or later.
Grateful. I think um, I will um, I will start. And to Bob's point, uh, there will definitely be some time at the end uh, for for any more questions that that uh, may pop up. Uh, it's been great so far. So um, so once you've used the tool and you have this list, uh, you know it's important to know what to do with that list and, and how to apply it to actually get um, retrofits in the ground. And so. Uh, now I'll just take some time to sort of walk through sort of at least what we would do um, after we've screened our basins and, and have those, um, those candidates. So um, our, the first item, the first item would be to visit these, these priority basins that have ranked out uh, as, as a candidate. Um, a lot of the photos here show um, someone with either a, a rod or a yardstick, a, a tape measure, uh, measuring these outlet structures. And that is something that we would absolutely recommend doing. Uh, it will help inform um, this, or, you know, it, the data would be used uh, during the modeling phase, uh, but you could also then just basically ground truth um, your assumptions from, from the tool itself. And so if, if we think that it's a, um, a box structure and you go out there and, oh, actually, I don't know how we missed it, but it's a culvert, uh, then that may be, you know, you, you may need to either rearrange where that falls on your priority list or um, sort of, you know, collect the data and, and, and move forward, but it may not be the, the initial um, retrofit type that, that was uh, kind of initially thought of. So um, the other uh, kind of interesting thing that we have picked up uh, from visiting basins are um, insights into the drainage area that was delineated. The lower left photo shows um, looking inside a grate and you can see there's three pipes there. Uh, I, I can't even probably count the times that we have um, noticed different pipes than uh, what may be uh, provided by a, a utility. Um, and so we, we may you know, find out that certain rooftops actually drain um, to the basin or, um, you know, or other areas that, that don't appear to be mapped uh, in GIS. Um, and so kind of checking those things out um, are also um, a helpful tool. Uh, in the guidance document, in the appendices, we have included um, basically a data sheet to collect the information on the outlet control structure, uh, which is what you see here. We look for some general information on, on the basin and then uh, what that outlet structure looks like um, and the the measurements on that, as well as any orifices that may be on like say a concrete box or a concrete manhole outlet structure. Uh, and then um, also information on the outlet pipe, uh, like the culvert, you know, leaving the, the whether it's a culvert from the um, basin itself or it's a culvert, um, you know, that discharges the flows from a, a control box. Uh, this could be collected via, you know, true survey and, and we have a kind of a place for that, or you could um, just take some more simple measurements off um, kind of a known elevation, whether that be the permanent pool elevation um, or the, the top of the berm elevation. Uh, I also show um, an example here. Uh, and I, I think personally, as, as somebody who has done a lot of the modeling, but has done less of the field uh, efforts, I cannot underscore the importance of uh, sketching out what that outlet structure looks like. Um, pictures do say a thousand words, but they uh, may be telling you the wrong words. And uh, it's not always clear what is in a photo um, versus how to uh, translate that. And so um, a sketch is really invaluable. Um, and then again, we would also really recommend taking pictures. Um, I don't think there's such a thing as too many pictures. So uh, photos of the overall basin, um, every side of a, of a structure, um, anything maybe that's um, you know sort of unclear in the field to kind of document and then um, use as a reminder to to go back and investigate more in the office uh, if there are you know, places of erosion or maintenance issues that you see in a basin. All of those may be items that you want to take photos of. Uh, and here are actually some photos of maintenance issues that have been seen uh, during um, visits to basins. In the upper left are some construction BMPs that are actually, uh, they somehow got forgotten about, uh, left in place even after construction was, was done and, and the site was demobilized. Uh, clearly this basin is not functioning as it was initially designed uh, by, by still having um, you know, all of these BMPs in place. 
So we already um, talked a bit about the upper right photo, which uh, shows all those logs and, and debris on an outlet structure. Uh, you know, this may be, um, if clogging is an issue, um, it, it's helpful to know that um, kind of as you're working through the design uh, and think about the maintenance. In the lower left is actually the downstream end of a culvert uh, that leaves a basin. So this is where the basin discharges into the stream. Uh, and as we visited this one, it was very clear that that um, head wall was starting to be undermined. Uh, the stream is eroding away. And uh, if it continues, uh, it is likely to take that head wall um, and potentially you know, the, the culvert and the berm of the, the uh, basin and all of that with it. And so uh, identifying items like this, um, you know, this is not maybe as easy as, as pulling a little debris off, um, off an outlet structure. Uh, but this is something that can be incorporated into a design and um, you know this maintenance um, could be done at that time. Uh, and then the photo on the bottom right is actually um, the discharge culvert from a basin uh, and it's submerged. Um, clearly pipes will be submerged in a basin that is designed to hold water but I can tell you that this one was not visited uh, anytime near a rainfall event and so this to me indicates that there's maybe um, a tailwater condition or downstream um, you know, maintenance that might need to be done to help this basin actually uh, drain and then um, function as it was um, you know, likely designed to be functioning. Uh, another next step, um, if, if you haven't yet found the drawings and the calculations, uh, now would be the ideal time to try again or um, try for the first time. Uh, these, um, this drawing here can show you, or it does show you, it's identified um, to have the, the grading of the basin um, shown here in the middle. And then it also shows you a detail of the outlet structure. Uh, this is great to have. You can compare it against what was measured and identified in the field. Uh, and they are not always one in the same. Um, that is actually why a lot of places are now requiring as built after um, they are designed because the, the basin was not constructed to the same amount of storage uh, as was designed. Um, it may have filled up with sediment or you know, orifice sizes um, change from, from drawings to construction. And so, uh, you know, you can see actually here, this one is, is denoted as an as-built. So everything should match um, between the field and these drawings. Um, something else that can be helpful are the uh, stormwater calculations. It is not um, common that the drainage area might be in the drawings, but it is pretty common that that uh, could be provided with the calculations. And so here is um, a drainage area map that was included uh, with the calculations. And then um, highlighted in yellow, we see some different um, discharge rates that were targeted um, and, and you know allowable discharges. So there's, um, and as I mentioned before, you can likely get free board information from, from the calculations also. So plenty of information to glean from here that could make um, you know, the modeling and the design effort um, a bit easier if these are, are items that are easy to, to collect. Uh, something else that, that may be available in your community are inspection reports. Uh, these, you know, these BMPs should be visited and should be inspected. Uh, whether or not they have reports on it uh, may be a different story, but here we see sort of the, the maintenance that uh, is recommended by the inspector on this basin, uh, which includes removing sediment buildup and removing vegetation. Uh, you know, if you have multiple inspection reports on one basin, you may be able to know, well, they're always removing vegetation. You know, maybe this is one that we actually remove turf grass and, and install native vegetation to make um, the maintenance of, of vegetation management a little easier. Or, you know, this is one that they're always, um, say, removing uh, sediment and, and logs from, and, and maybe restricting the low flow orifice farther is not, um, you know, the best uh, option for this basin because we just feel that the, the clogging risk may increase to a level that we're not comfortable with. Um, and these are things that a, a design engineer could, could help with also, um, but having that information is really the first step. Uh, and so, after we, we gather all this information, uh, that's when you can really dive into modeling. Uh, and if you haven't hired a, a actual um, engineer by this point, um, this is probably about the time that we would, we would recommend that. 
uh, modeling can really range across the board and will depend on um, the funding and uh, community needs and, and wants for a project. Uh, on the left is just a very simple model that includes the drainage area in green and the basin in blue. Uh, you could just um, you know, modify that, that basin outlet in the model and, and kind of get to your retrofit that way. It really um, is a pretty simple and quick uh, way to model and, and show you the benefits in the um, free board for an individual retrofit. Um, the drawback of doing that is that you don't really see those benefits on a watershed scale. And so the, the image on the right is of a model um, of, a, of a whole watershed. Uh, it, it does not include every drainage area, um, or I should say every basin and associated drainage area um, in the entire watershed, but it does include several um, that we would look to retrofit. Um, one of the benefits of this is that if you are using a phased approach, you could uh, model you know, with a few retrofits initially, and as more are implemented, you could um, make those modifications to a single model to see uh, continually what those um, you know, watershed-wide benefits uh, may be as, as implementation progresses. Uh, and you could also try different retrofits at different locations to see different benefits. Uh, but if funding doesn't allow um, for a watershed-wide model, it's, it's not a reason to shy away from retrofits as a whole. There, there is a simpler um, option. It just won't quite give you the full um, picture for your watershed. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we take those model results and we put them on paper uh, with, with the designs. Uh, these two examples here are just simple detail sheets. Uh, we've had quite a bit of luck um, with just um, using some straightforward details, uh, as you see here, showing what the existing structure looks like and then uh, what a um, what the proposed modifications look like with with some notes um, in the guidance document itself we have uh, more detailed information um, and more several more example uh, plan sheets for uh, for you know, design of these retrofits uh, some of them include plan view and some do not uh, I would say that a plan view is really a must if you're going to do a more expensive retrofit with grading. Uh, but if it's going to be more of a V-notch weir or um, restriction style, it's likely um, that you can get a, you can you know sufficiently portray that design uh, by just using some details, um, and that should you know also help with efficiency. And so, uh, I believe with that, um, I will um, take one more pause for questions uh, before kind of. We let Bob uh, wrap it up. Awesome. While we're waiting for questions, I just want to go back and point this out really quickly. Um, uh, this is another great example. So here's the stream. And you see a kind of a mini waterfall back here. So this is what the stream used to look like. And the design of this outfall was designed to tie into that, you know, if you kind of project that elevation this way. And uh, this is the result of a head cut that migrated up through the system. And just the kind of the benefits of getting out in the field and first of all, knowing your streams, which you all already do, but also uh, public safety risks, you know, um, especially with climate change and and um, some of the other questions we got earlier, you know, as as Nora described, this is this outlet um, uh, structure is is basically undermined by several feet, and you know is becoming geotechnically unstable. And as that headwall fails, and the pipe kind of becomes dislodged, then the, the flow can start eating through that berm and then all of a sudden the berm can kind of be washed away. That's how these things tend to fail when you see kind of those, like Nora mentioned, those kind of catastrophic road failures and things like that. So um, another advantage of kind of thinking about retrofit programs a little bit more broadly from the kind of public safety risk and maybe the public work side of things and how you can really complement both of those styles of programs where you could kind of shore up this with some, you know, uh, armoring at the outfall, maybe some, 
some reach scale restoration with some ripples and pools here, and maybe even evaluating the spillway to see, all right, we've got this basin shored up for public safety and we've been able to restrict it to uh, benefit um, the stream network and reduce those rates of down cutting downstream and prevent this type of problem, you know, from cascading farther upstream and affecting other basins and other roadways and infrastructure. So it just kind of shows you how it all really is tied together. Um, and, the, and the bigger that you can think with these retrofit programs, probably the better in terms of multiple stakeholder benefits, public safety being one of them, you know, improve water quality, uh, ecological lift and so forth. All right, I uh, don't see any questions unless Kim, you wanna let me know. Don't see any in the chat. Um, actually one just popped in. Um, a question here from Marianne, uh, does your retrofit decision tree include any analysis of nutrient reductions? Good question. So um, we say in the, um, in the uh, document that retrofits can be done for any purpose. So uh, uh, we've seen retrofits done for combined sewer overflow mitigation, for example. So you've got a detention basin that controls stormwater in a combined sewer neighborhood, and you're optimizing that retrofit to reduce combined sewer overflows as opposed to reducing Q-critical exceedances, for example. Um, so we, um, we've really showcased the stream erosion benefits here um, but in terms of nutrient reductions, one thing I should underscore is that a lot of the nutrients in uh, waterways are actually um, coming off of the bank sediment that's eroding from stream erosion. So inherently, if you're reducing stream erosion, you are uh, reducing nutrient loads associated with the sediment that is attached to that um, to the bank sediment, right? Um, if you're facilitating geomorphic recovery, developing benches and facilitating a low flow channel, retaining more wood in the system, all of that also benefits nutrient cycling, right? So there's, there's those components, um, but you, you can actually optimize the design for anything like design of an individual basin. So if you've got a basin that isn't a water quality basin and uh, you're, you can do a more expensive retrofit, uh, installing a sediment floor bay, for example, uh, as Nora mentioned, converting it to maybe native vegetation or a stream wetland complex, all of those things can be, you know, kind of factored in here. Um, one of the things that we saw at the Toyota basin that we first retrofit with the US EPA was simply by restricting the outlet, uh, we've induced ponding longer in the basin and, and creating more topsoil saturation uh, more contact with the vegetation, more UV exposure, and so on and so forth. So just by a hydraulic benefit, uh, US EPA has, has data that shows that that actually is a, is a uh, water quality benefit as well, just by the prolonged um, uh, retention, detention time in the, in the, in the pond. Uh, the last thing I'll say, though, is the reason that um, the tension basin or the detain the H2O um, uh, feature looks so hefty and has all those bolts is because one option with that is to basically, instead of a plate, you have a media that you, so you restrict the flow of the media like switchgrass or, um, gravels or whatever to, um, basically, you know, perform some, some nutrient management and other water quality benefits like removing metals and so forth. So, so you can absolutely design these retrofits for, um, you know, nutrient removal. Uh, it just depends on what's, what's kind of the biggest pollutant of concern uh, for the watershed as a whole and the, and the basin that you're uh, looking at. And also, um, you know, how does it fit in with the bigger picture and how do you get kind of the best bang for the buck in terms of global benefits to the watershed? But uh, absolutely great question. And you can certainly optimize an individual basin or a, a, a a whole watershed wide network for uh, specific um, design criteria. Great. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so feel free to enter your questions or, or unmute yourself to ask a question. 
Awesome. Um, well, I am going to, I've got just, I think, five more slides here, and then we'll have um, plenty of time for concluding questions. Um, but um, that previous question really uh, set us up well for these kind of concluding remarks. So, um, you know, uh, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, so detention based in, or, you know, detention, retention based in retrofits are, can be a very cost effective tool in a lot of watersheds. Uh, we, we see them as one of the low hanging fruits. And um, uh, as far as what the literature shows, a lot of the nutrient and sediment benefits in a stream network uh, from BMPs really comes from the, the hydrological benefits of SEMs as opposed to the filtration benefits of SEMs. So just by knocking down those bigger flows and by kind of holding back water and prolonging base flows, you, get, you tend to get more water quality benefits downstream than simply by you know, uh, filtration. It's not to say, I'm not saying that sediment and erosion control is, is not important, it certainly is, and I'm not trying to undersell it. And, and water quality volumes are, are certainly important. But when you're kind of looking at this wa large watershed restoration strategy and these kind of chronically unmanaged basins, um, trying to get more flow intercepted and held back efficiently is really the big broad goal. And so detention basin retrofits are one very important tool in that toolbox, but you know, stream wetland complexes, kind of new BMPs like that, uh, channel, uh, or sorry, off channel, floodplain restoration or wetland restoration, what we're calling um, bankful wetlands, sometimes we refer to them that way. Those can be really efficient places to get nutrient benefits, sediment benefits, and offloading erosive flows. Um, basically, here's your old, here's your existing stream. This is a floodplain that used to not be very well connected. We excavate, you know, five feet of post-settlement alluvium that's just taking up space in the floodplain bottom. And we get that connected at a way that offloads erosive energy into that uh, restored wetland. Um, that also provides nice habitat benefits for um, sensitive species and rare, rare species uh, off channel pools, things like that. Um, and then the hand placed logs in uh, forested reaches, you can do a lot more of these on a cost per foot basis than, you know, kind of conventional uh, restoration with equipment uh, in terms of benefiting a lot of reach with low cost. So uh, we do have a freely available guidebook on, on kind of these more holistic, uh, these kind of low cost strategies at, at getting at watershed scale benefits uh, that we recently put out with US Fish and Wildlife. Um, so, you know, if you don't already have that, uh, shoot me an email and we can, we can get that to you or check out our website and, and uh, we can get it to you. Um, but just a quick example, and I think this really underscores Jared's question um, about you know, how much is enough? Um, well, you know, let's say you can only get to like 10% of your impervious area effectively managed. That, that could be enough, right? We, we, we really don't know. And so you won't know until you try. But one thing we do know is that if you can give the stream more roughness and give the stream more resistance to erosion on a cost-effective way, that will also benefit the stream and help it switch to a more geomorphic recovery trajectory. So this is an example of some of the hand-placed log structures we've, we've installed with several conservation districts in Ohio. Um, so here's a picture of the before bank. This is about a four foot tall vertical bank. You see a you know, outside bend here. Uh, we just put long, long logs that, you know, uh, super long, uh, big enough, you know, not, not so large that you can't carry them with like two or three people and get them installed and ramped up out of the bank, preferably anchored behind a live tree, but sometimes we have to anchor them with stakes, and then lots of brush in between them kind of weaving in and out. Um, uh, we, we, this, is, this is kind of the before and after, but you can literally see the change in the flow pattern by diverting that flow off of the bank, uh, adding a lot of roughness here, you're kind of focusing that energy back towards the middle of the channel and away from that bank, and give this thing a couple of years and you'll start to see uh, some, some deposition here and some vegetation uh, recolonization. You might have seen me present on this strategy at Ohio Stormwater Conference in the past. So, um, you know, where I show like several years after in the, in the vegetation recovery. Um, another thing, uh, if you're going to do the hand-placed log structures, uh, not just kind of addressing individual banks, but 
we really like these channel spanning log jams. Um, so, you know, every, every so many, you know, 100 feet or so, depending on the elevation gradient, uh, trying to get, um, you know, find a place where you've got live trees on both banks where you can ramp up logs behind those live trees and then form a nice, really nice jam, kind of like, in, imagine like a leaky beaver dam, right? And, and these, adding this level of, of logs and this level of roughness helps immediately slow down that, the flows. Even, at, even during low flow conditions, you can see kind of lower velocities, more pooling, and, you know, again, just better hydraulic benefits through that, through that system. So, um, you know, it depends on access, depends on uh, availability of logs and, and kind of volunteer or, you know, um, partner labor to help install these. But this can be a really nice complement to those um, retrofit strategies where, you know, maybe you can't get all the way to our goal of 50% of the impervious area managed, but you can complement it with some getting the channel, the roughness it needs to help resist that erosion. Um, and then I mentioned this that earlier, um, we strongly recommend adaptive management, including monitoring. And this does not need to be expensive monitoring. You don't need to do a lot of water quality sampling. You don't even really need gauge, uh, gauges installed. But at a minimum, I'd, I'd recommend photo documentation from the same vantage point. So you can see, uh, are you inducing the deposition along these formerly unstable banks? And is that deposition becoming colonized by vegetation? These types of geomorphic transitions should be visually apparent. So a photographic um, monitoring program is really, it should be sufficient because the, um, the, 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 these transformations should be that obvious, right? And, um, you know, if you don't see these types of transitions, maybe it means the climate was really bad the last five years, or maybe it means we didn't retrofit enough basins, right? We didn't control enough of the impervious area but we won't know without monitoring. So I really, really recommend getting some monitoring out there. You know, cross sections are great. Uh, if you can do kind of monumented cross sections, but even just a photo at the same location is, um, is, is, is suitable. And so with that, um, that kind of wraps up our overall uh, presentation. Again, we've got lots of guidance documents and um, you know, additional modules for training. And um, I think we got about 10 more minutes of Question time if, if folks have them. Don't yet see any questions in the chat, but just wanted to remind everybody um, that this training is being recorded. Um, we'll have the recorded video training um, on our CRWP's YouTube channel. We'll have a link to that on CRWP's webpage. We'll also have links to the modules that we've referenced throughout the training. Um, they're on our YouTube channel and we'll have links to those on our webpage as well, including a link to that screening tool guidance document that we've been referencing. And then if you're a participant in the collaborative, we'll also be sharing all those materials on the collaborative's um, file sharing website box. So uh, thank you for the comment there, Elizabeth. Um, you've enjoyed uh, the training and if anyone else has any more questions please enter them into the chat or raise your hand or unmute to ask your question um, and Roy go ahead and ask your question it looks like your hand is raised okay thank you nice presentation learned a lot look forward to being able to implement this um, in our individual areas I do have uh, some questions about the modules. Very interesting. Um, the ones in particular were those that involved hand work for calculating drainage and uh, ponds themselves and also pond volume then. And uh, uh, two questions. It seems to me in going through, there were maybe three ways to identify ponds, let's say. and. And then we we'll calculate volume, but aerial photos, fine. Uh, contours, fine. And then the uh, DEMs, especially LIDAR. <clears throat> and it seems to me that in the example shown, that the, that the DEM approach uh, outshone everything. And uh, is this just my impression? 
or is there some reason to augment what a LiDAR DM can tell you? Uh, is there any reason to augment that really with contours and aerial focus? Um, I guess I could speak to that. Um, so, yeah, the, um, I mean, at least for me personally, yeah, using um, the DEM and doing the polygon volume and like that geo processing, um, you know, definitely, um, you know, gets it all to you like really quickly. And you can do like the whole, um, every basin um, that you've identified like in one fell swoop. Um, but that, and, and, you know, I'm not aware of like everyone in the club and like what level of like GIS capabilities everyone has or, um, you know, what um, like software or, um, you know, like subscriptions if you have Esri products. Um, so that using the DEM and using that geo processing like is, is amazing, but it does require, um, you know, having um, that ArcGIS and having access to those spatial analyst um, plugins and the 3D analyst plugins. Um, so using just, you know, contours and, you know, service areas and that simple math is a great way to approximate those, like what you could get with GIS, like with that, um, like high level geo processing without actually having access to that geo processing. Um, so that would be a reason why. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, as a collaborator, uh, we, uh, we can assemble the GIS resources that people can use yeah. and get around this. Yeah, because you're right, not everybody has it. I use Google Earth uh, for most cases, and I have been very lucky to get uh, LiDAR tiles uh, for the areas in which I work, which helped me immensely. Not everybody has that, but um, but I, as, as a collaborative why uh, we could do that. And, and that's, I think, also meant for uh, understanding drainages. I really had fun watching you, I believe, uh, trace those drainages based on contours, but I got <laughs> so times. So I would. Um, I doing stuff by hand is a lot of fun, but I don't have too much confidence in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, anyway, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, no, and um, I mean, there are, what is it? Um, what is it, model my watershed? Or um, what's the uh, USGS, um, Bob or Nora, that um, you can click on the point and it results in a drainage area. There are, um, Stream stats. Stream, Stream stats, stats, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, oh, and how's my water wet? Yeah, so there are, um, yeah, stream stats and like other um, resources online that you can also just, you know, approximate the watershed area using like, uh, they're like probably um, USGS, like 30 meter DEMs, which can get you like, to a start, you know, you're like, okay, I have this approximation of a drainage area. And then, you know, um, try you know, using the contours to kind of refine that. And also like, yeah, I probably made it look very, um, you know, you're just like, oh, just simple, follow these lines. Um, but, you know, once upon a time, I, I never delineated a drainage area and it was <laughs> really intimidating, but now it's like second nature, so just, yeah, thank you. The contours are, yeah, they, they show you the way, yeah, but yeah, it's speaking to like the collaborative, yeah, like getting like connecting, linking up, um, you know, getting those um, like geoprocessing that like you might not have access to like with one of your partners, like that's, that's amazing, you know, like it's why you'll exist, huh? So yeah, thank you. Uh, I might also add to that uh, if um, one item of information that we did not have as we were doing our analyses were um, stormwater infrastructure, so pipes and, mm -hmm. and catch basins. And so uh, you would think that everything always flows downhill, uh, but it's 
not necessarily the case that there isn't um, a pipe or two out there in a catch basin that's collecting uh, and the, the, you know, the ground topography may flow one way, but the pipe actually flows a different way. And so, uh, you know, you, you may be surprised um, uh, in that aspect when infrastructure is also overlaid um, with the topography. And so um, I think checking from an, uh, an automatic or a, you know, a digital process to calculate a drainage area, um, kind of visually checking that to make sure that it doesn't conflict with the in infrastructure, if you have that, that level of information, um, would be valuable just to, to tweak anything you know, that may need to be tweaked that was a, an automatically generated set of information. Yeah, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I've just, Bob, did you have anything to add to um, Nora and Shelby's comments on, on that question? Uh, yeah, unless someone has another question, I, I was gonna say, um, you know, Roy's uh, questions and Shelby's answer really underscore how uh, this tool and the, and the modules, um, we're trying to give you multiple ways to, to get to the endpoint, right? And everybody's going to be a little different and every watershed is going to be a little different. But uh, the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll get um, with, with your way of doing it, right? And even some of those rules about like, well, we really like one to two inches of potential rainfall capture. Well, you might find that like in your watershed, wow, you, when you get to 1.2 inches, it's, it works every time, right? I mean, so again, the more you do it, the, 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 ease, the more these you know, rules will actually like be kind of calibrated to your watershed and your region. And, and so um, you know, that's, that's kind of why we give you lots of different ways to get there um, so that everybody can kind of find their sweet spot. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat, um, but I did just want to give a big thank you to Sustainable Streams and your entire team. Um, the Collaborative has really appreciated working with you on this project. I think this is going to be a very useful screening tool. We're really excited to move it to implementation in our watersheds across the, the basins watersheds. Um, and I also just, again, wanted to thank the Ohio EPA Section 319 grant program for supporting this work. And um, thank you to all our matching partners and to our participants in the training today. So um, thanks to everybody for joining. Are there any last minute questions before we wrap up here or comments? So uh, Bob, Nora, and Shelby, I, I assume you're on permanent retainer with us. We can certainly we love working with you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely have loved collaborating with you. Uh, these are the kind of partners we love to work with. You know, this is our whole mission of, of, of uh, kind of working with, with local folks who know their watersheds and, and, and uh, helping to facilitate those recoveries. So it's been a real, real pleasure. And thank you very much. And thanks again to those who attended today to, uh, for this. And I really hope we see some implementation um, in the ground. Good, okay. Thank you everybody so much for joining. I'll go ahead and um, end the recording here and uh...